The Stake by Richard Lehman. Copyright 1991 by Richard Lehman. Read by Chuck Benson. This book was originally created for audio cassette playback. Any announcements concerning cassettes do not apply to this recording. This version contains markers allowing direct access to major portions of the book. Library of Congress Annotation While day tripping in backcountry California, two couples come upon a ghost town hotel. Larry, who is writing a vampire novel, and Pete decide to explore. Discovering a female body with a stake through her heart, they unleash unexpected horrors, violence, strong language, and some explicit descriptions of sex. 1991 From the Book Jacket In an isolated corner of a deserted hotel, horror writer Larry Dunbar uncovers a grisly relic. It's naked, it's female, and it has a wooden stake through its heart. She was a young, innocent high school senior named Bonnie Saxon, sacrificed on the altar of a madman's obsession to rid the earth of its most ancient, pitiless evil, the curse of the vampire. A world of horrors was born the day the stake was driven in. Now Larry Dunbar wants to pull it out. This book is dedicated to Frank, Kathy, and Leah de la Rada, great friends fellow explorers, and ghost town busters. Prologue, Charleston, Illinois, June 23, 1972. He had stalked the demon to her lair. Now he waited, waited for dawn when she would be most vulnerable. The waiting was the worst part, knowing what was to come. The legends he'd learned were not to be trusted. The legends were wrong in so many ways. Vampires slept in beds, not coffins, a clever ruse to fool the unknowing, and although daylight sapped their powers, it did not render them helpless. Even after dawn they could wake from their sleep of the dead. They could fight him, hurt him. He rubbed his cheek. His fingers trembled along crusty ridges of scab. She'd had sharp fingernails, the one in Urbana. He shuddered with the memory. He'd been lucky to save himself. Maybe he'd used up his luck on that one. Maybe this time it wouldn't be fingernails ripping his cheek. Maybe this time teeth would find his throat. Ducking down against the steering wheel, he reached under the driver's seat and pulled out a bottle of bourbon. He twisted off its cap. He drank. The liquor was lukewarm going down, but it spread soothing heat through his stomach. He wanted to drink more. Later he promised himself, no more until the task is done. You must keep your wits about you, he thought. It was the liquor that almost got you killed last week. These monsters are clever. Again he rubbed his scratched cheek. He took one more drink, then forced himself to cap the bottle. He slid it under the seat. As he straightened up, a car turned the corner ahead. Its headlights were on, but the morning sky was light enough to show the rack on top. A patrol car. He threw himself down across the passenger seat. His mouth felt dry. His heart thundered. It's not right, he thought. I shouldn't have to live like a fugitive. I'm as much a public servant as those police out there. He held his breath as the patrol car cruised by. It passed so close that he could hear crackles, squawks, and a garbled voice from its radio. He regretted his decision to leave the windows down. They might find that suspicious. But his car would have been stifling if he'd kept it closed up. He breathed again as the sounds faded. He stayed low, counting slowly to one hundred. Then he sat up and peered out the rear window. The red taillights were mere specks. Opening his door, he leaned out and studied the sky. It was still gray beyond the peaked roof of the vampire's dwelling. He placed a foot on the curb, straightened up, and peered over the roof of his car. To the east, the sky was pale blue. From long experience, he knew that the sun would soon appear above the horizon. It would be up by the time he was in position. He sank back into the car. His silver crucifix hung against his chest. He fingered its chain and pulled the cross out from under his shirt. Then he lifted a leather briefcase off the floor in front of the passenger seat. Reaching into the case, he pulled out a necklace of garlic cloves. He looped it over his head. Briefcase in hand, he stepped out of the car. The overgrown lawn was surrounded by a picket fence. He swung the gate wide, kicking its bottom past tufts of weed that were high enough to hold it open. Coming out this way, he would be carrying the body. He didn't want the gate slowing him down. 
The porch stairs creaked under his weight. The screen door groaned. Inside the porch, he used a wicker chair to prop the door open. Twisting the knob, he found that the front door wasn't locked. That made it easy. He wouldn't need his pry bar. He crept silently into the house and didn't shut the door. He knew where to find her room. Shortly after she'd entered, last night, lights had appeared in the front windows to the right of the porch. She'd stepped up to each of the windows and lowered the shades. The house was silent. The faint light that found its way into the living room cast a gray shroud over the old sofa, the rocking chair, the lamps and piano. The wallpaper looked faded and stained. Above the piano hung an oil painting of a forest clearing with a peaceful running brook. In the gloom, it looked dim and somber, as if dawn hadn't yet come to the forest scene. At the far corner of the room was a wood-framed entrance to a hallway. He crept to the hallway and followed it to the open door of the vampire's bedroom. His mouth went dry and his heart pounded as he gazed in at her. She lay on a bed between the two windows, curled on her side, facing away from him. The first rays of the morning sun glowed against the blinds, filling the room with an amber hue. She was covered only by a sheet. Her dark hair was spread against the pillow. Crouching, he set his briefcase on the floor. He spread its top, reached in, and lifted out the hammer. A sledge with a heavy steel head and a foot-long haft. With his other hand, he took out a pointed stake of ash wood. He clamped the stake in his teeth. He stood up. Staring at the vampire, he willed her to roll over. Face up or down, it didn't matter. He could pound the stake through her back as easily as her chest. But she had to be lying flat, not on her side. Somehow he'd known this would be a difficult kill. Should he wait? Eventually she was bound to turn over. The longer he waited, the more danger of being seen when he carried the body out, and he had to do that take it far away in the trunk of his car and hide it where it would never be found. People vanished all the time, and for many reasons, but to be discovered here with a stake in her heart. The police would stupidly mistake it as the work of a homicidal maniac. The news would spread. The populace would panic. Worst of all, a legion of vampires would suddenly be put on guard that a hunter was in their midst. And this morning's efforts would be in vain, for the police or coroner were certain to pull the stake from her heart. She would live again to prowl the night. No, she had to disappear. A floorboard creaked as he stepped to the side of the bed. She moaned, squirmed a little beneath the sheet, but didn't turn over. The stake still held in his teeth, he reached out with his left hand. He pinched the sheet where its edge curled over her shoulder. As he eased it down, she continued to take long, slow breaths but his own breathing quickened. The sliding sheet revealed her naked back, the smooth curves of her buttocks, her sleek legs. She was a vampire, a vile, murdering demon. But her body was that of a slender young woman, and he felt a stir of heat in his groin as he studied her. He trembled with the familiar mingling of lust and terror, a sensation close to ecstasy which always came upon him at such moments. He used to feel ashamed of his desire, Finally, however, he'd come to consider it a reward for his sacrifices, a payment of sorts bestowed upon him to balance out the risks. Without it, he would have lost the will long ago to continue his crusade. He knew this to be true. Confronting vampires of the male gender, he felt no such arousal, only revulsion. As a result, he had ceased to seek them out. He considered this to be his greatest failing, but often told himself that he was doing his share. He was one man against a horde. He couldn't dispatch them all. He had to be selective, so he selected the women. Horrid as they were, they excited him. Her left arm lay against her side, bent at the elbow, the rest out of sight. Its skin was pebbled with tiny bumps from the cool morning air. Leaning forward, he peered over her upper arm at the swell of her breast. It had goose flesh like her arm. Her nipple stood erect. From this position, he couldn't see her other breast. As he stared, saliva began to spill over his lip. He tried to shut his mouth, but the stake was in the way. He jerked his left hand up to catch the drool, but not in time. A string of spit dribbled onto the vampire's arm. Mumbling, she slid a hand out from under her pillow, brushed the wetness, rolled onto her back, and frowned as if perplexed. Still, her eyes were shut. She took the hand away. It fell onto the mattress beside her hip. 
It rubbed the sheet, then rose and came to rest on her thigh, the end of her thumb sinking into the thick nest of hair at her groin. As he watched, full of dread that she might awaken, yet trembling with a fever of desire, he took the stake from his teeth. He knew he should wait no longer. But he hesitated. His eyes roamed her sleeping form. Though she might be centuries old, her face and body were those of a teenage girl. She looked no older than seventeen or eighteen. She looked lovely, innocent, delicious. If only she were human and not a foul, loathsome creature of the night. He ached to kiss those lips which had sucked so much innocent blood. He ached to caress those breasts, to savor their velvety smoothness, to feel the soft rub of those nipples against his palms. He ached to spread those legs and slide deep into her heat. If only she weren't a vampire. Such a shame, such a waste. Get it over with, he told himself. He leaned farther forward, knees pressing against the side of the mattress, and raised his hammer high. His other hand twitched and fluttered as it lowered the tapered shaft toward her chest. The shaking point passed over her left breast, moved slightly higher, hovered half an inch above her skin. There, one strong blow, and— Her eyes leaped open. She gasped. She clutched his wrist, twisted it with all the might of her demonic powers. Crying out, he watched in horror as the stake dropped from his numb fingers and fell, blunt end first, toward her other breast. A feeling of utter desolation swept through him like an icy flood, without the stake. As it bounced off her breast, he strained against her grip, praying to retrieve it, but her fierce hold was too powerful. The stake slid out of sight beyond her rib cage. He knew then that all was lost. Still, he swung the hammer down at her face. Crying out, she yanked his trapped wrist. She flung up her other arm, blocking the blow as he fell toward her. He sprawled across her chest. An arm clamped tight against his back, and she bucked beneath him, squirming and turning, tumbling him over her body. He no sooner hit the mattress than she scurried onto him and smashed a knee into his groin. His breath blasted out. Stunned with agony, he saw the wooden shaft in her hand, watched her raise it above his face. He tried to ward off the blow, but his stricken muscles failed to obey. He had just enough breath to choke out a scream as the stake's point punched through his eye. Explorers 1. How about a little detour on the way home? Pete asked. He started his van moving, its tires crunched over the gravel of the parking lot. A detour sounded good to Larry, but he said nothing. He knew that Pete's suggestion had been directed to those in the seats behind them. If the wives didn't go for it, the matter was closed. You aren't going to get us lost again, are you? Barbara asked. Who, me? He gets us on those back roads, no telling where we'll end up. I always get us home, don't I? Eventually. Pete glanced at Larry, a corner of his mouth turned up, lifting that side of his mustache. Why do I put up with this, I ask you? Before Larry could come up with an answer, Barbara leaned forward and hooked a tawny forearm across her husband's throat. Because you love me, right? she asked. She nipped the ridge of his ear. Hey, hey, calm down. You want to run me off the road? She wore a sleeveless blouse. A sprinkling of freckles showed on her deeply tanned shoulder. Though the air conditioner was blowing cool air into the van, the skin above her lip gleamed with moisture under a fine curly down. Larry didn't want to be caught staring, so he looked away. Just ahead, an old-timer dressed like a prospector was leading a burrow along the road's dusty shoulder. Larry wondered if the guy was for real. Silver Junction, the town they were leaving behind, was full of characters in Old West get-ups. Some seemed like the real article, but he had no doubt that most were simply playing the role for the benefit of the tourists. So, how about it? Pete asked as Barbara released him. Want to do some exploring? I think it'd be fun, Jean said. You in a hurry to get home, Larry? Me? No. He always hates to lose a day, she explained. I have an awful time trying to drag him out of the house. The day's already shot, he said. Same to you, fella, Barbara said. Whoops, didn't mean it that way. It's been great. It had been a nice change from his usual seven-day work schedule. Fun being out with Pete and Barbara. Wandering the old town, watching the gunfight on Main Street, having a burger and a couple of beers in the picturesque saloon. I need to get out more anyway or I'd run dry. Everything we do ends up in his books, Jean explained. 
but he still hates to be dragged away from his almighty word processor. That's what keeps a roof over our heads. Pete tipped his head back as if to carom his voice off the top of the windshield, the better for Barbara to hear. Let's take him to that ghost town. A ghost town. A warm, pleasant tightness came to Larry's chest and throat. You think you can find it? Barbara asked. No sweat. He turned to Larry, grinning. You'll love it. Just your kind of place. It's pretty spooky, all right, Barbara said. He'll be in hog heaven. I bet you get a book out of it, Pete told him. Call it The Horror of Sagebrush Flat. Maybe have some weirdos lurking around, chopping up everyone. Larry could feel himself blushing a little with the stir of pride that came whenever people started referring to his grisly novels. If I did, he said, you wouldn't read it. I will, Barbara assured him. I know you will. You're my best fan. I'll wait for the movie, Pete announced. You'll have a long wait. You're going to make it, he said, nodding at Larry and narrowing one eye. Barbara gave the back of his head a gentle whack. He's already made it, dickhead. Hey, hey, watch it with the hands. He smoothed his must hair. The thick black hair was threaded with strands of gray. His mustache, with a lot more gray in it, looked as if it belonged on an older face. You'll be a wizened, silver-haired old coot, Larry said, before they ever make a movie of one of my books. Ah, bull, you'll make it, mark my words. He tilted his head. The Beast of Sagebrush Flat. I can see it now. I've got to be one of the characters, right? Of course. You're the guy driving. Who's going to play me? Has to be someone suitably handsome and dashing. Pee Wee Herman, Barbara suggested. You about ready to die, honey? De Niro, Larry said. He'd be perfect. Pete raised an eyebrow and stroked his mustache. Think so? He's kind of old. You're no spring chicken. Hey, thirty-nine. Hardly counts as one foot in the grave. Before you start losing your eyesight, you'd better watch for the turnoff. I know just where it is, never fear. I've got a natural instinct for these things. De Niro, huh? Yeah, I like that. You'd better slow down, Barbara told him. Don't get your shorts in a knot, huh? I know exactly where we're going. The van swept around a curb of the two-lane blacktop and shot past a road that led off to the left. That was it, smart guy. He leaned against his door and watched the road recede in the side mirror. Nah. Oh, yes, it was. They never listened to us, Jean said. That wasn't it, Pete muttered, stepping on the brake. The van slowed. He pulled onto the gravel shoulder, stopped, cranked his window down, and stared back. You really think that's it, honey? If you don't believe me, keep going. Shit. Maybe we won't be visiting a ghost town today, Jean said, sounding amused. Larry turned in his seat and looked at her. Smiling, she rolled her eyes upward. That expression was as good as words. What have we gotten ourselves into? Like Larry, she always got a kick out of the good-natured bickering that went on between Pete and Barbara. But they'd seen the arguments turn nasty and had occasionally overheard quarrels that sounded truly vicious coming from the couple's next-door house. Why don't we give that road a try, Larry suggested. It's not the one. Prince Henry the Navigator, Barbara muttered. Maybe we should flip a coin, Jean said. Do you have a map? Larry asked. Pete doesn't believe in them, Barbara told him, her voice pleasant. Amazing how she reserved the sarcasm for her husband. It's up to you, Peter. I've offered my opinion. Feel free to ignore it. Oh, hell, he muttered. He started to turn the van around, and Larry saw the look of relief on Jean's face. If it's the wrong road, Larry told Barbara, we hold you personally responsible. She bared her teeth at him, then laughed softly. That's telling her, pal. Pete turned the van onto the side road and stepped on the gas. He drove up the middle, ignoring the faded white line. There wasn't enough left of the speed limit sign to read its numbers. The metal had been riddled with bullets. Some of the holes looked fresh, but many were fringed with rust. Pete pointed at the sign. There's some local color for you. Old Barb's really going to be in trouble if we not only take the wrong road, but get shot in the bargain. We'll duck if we see any bargain hunters, Larry said. Ha, good one. I hate to tell you, they're in the back seat. Can't miss at this range, Jean said. We're dead meat. 
You've got nothing to worry about, Petey. You're no bargain. I know. I'm priceless. I'm also smart enough to know this isn't the road to Sagebrush Flat. But here we are anyway. It was a good decision, Larry assured him. In my vast experience, I've found it always wiser to go along with female advice. That's because it's usually right, Jean said. Either way, he told Pete, you can't lose. First you make them happy by doing what they tell you. That's the main thing. Let them think they're in control. They love it. Then, if it turns out they were right, everything's cool. If it turns out they were wrong, which is usually the case, Pete added. Do they know what thin ice they're on? Jean asked. If they're wrong, Larry went on, then you have the pleasure of basking in the glow of superiority. Pete grinned and nodded. Hey, you ought to put that in one of your books. It was in one of his books, Barbara said. If I'm not mistaken, a redneck cop spoke pretty much those very words in Dead of Night. Yeah? No kidding, Larry asked, amazed that she had remembered such a thing. Don't you remember? He'd quoted one of his own characters without even realizing it? Odd, he thought, and a little disturbing. I don't know, he admitted. If you say so, I guess it's there. The philosophy at work, Pete said. No, I mean it. I write so much. That book was a long time ago. I have the advantage, Barbara said. I just read it last month. Hey, maybe you're becoming that guy, turning into your redneck cop. There's an idea for a story, huh? A writer starts turning into this character he made up. Has possibilities. Well, if you use it, remember where you got the idea. Aha, Barbara said, over on the left. Looking across the road, Larry saw the ruins of an old structure. It no longer had a roof. The door and window panes, if it ever had them, were gone. The upper portions of the walls had crumbled away, and some of the rocks that might once have formed the square enclosure now lay in rubble around it, returning to the desert from which they'd been taken. Well, Pete said, I guess this is the right road. Prince Henry. Doesn't look like much of a ghost town, Jean remarked. That isn't it, Barbara told her. But we stopped and had a look around before we got to Sagebrush Flat. Nothing much there, Pete said. Want to take a quick look? I'd rather get on to the main attraction. In spite of Jean's earlier comments about her difficulties in getting him out of the house, they'd taken several day trips during the past year to explore the region. Sometimes with Pete and Barbara, a few times by themselves or with Lane, when they could drag their seventeen-year-old daughter away from home. On those outings, Larry had seen plenty of ruins similar to the one they were leaving behind, but not a real ghost town. Don't you always wonder who lived in places like that? Jean asked. Prospectors, I should think, Pete said. Dead guys, Larry quoted. Leave it to you, the morbid touch. Actually, that was Lane's comment. Dead guys. Remember, hon? She went back to the car and waited for us that time. She wanted nothing to do with it. I know the feeling, Barbara said. I think this stuff's interesting, but you gotta know that whoever lived there's been pushing up daisies for a while. Cactus, Pete said. Whatever. Anyway, dead. Makes it kind of spooky. All the better for Larry here. Doesn't bother me, Jean said. I just think it's neat to see where they used to live and, you know, imagine what it must have been like. It's history. Speaking of history, Larry said, what do you know about this ghost town of yours? Not much, Pete told him. He doesn't even know where it is. It must be in some of those guidebooks, Jean said. Nope, we checked. I guess it's nothing all that special, Pete said. Maybe it's not an official ghost town or whatever it takes to get noticed. Just a wide spot on the road that got deserted. He suddenly grinned at Larry. Hey, suppose it's just there for us. You know, like a figment of our imaginations. A ghost ghost town. Yeah, how about that? Another idea for you. You're going to have to start paying me a consultant's fee. you do better if you wrote the books yourself. Hey, maybe I ought to give it a try. How long does it take you to knock out one of those things? Six months, maybe, to write one. About twenty-five years to learn how. You'd better just stick to repairing televisions, Barbara said. We coming up on the turnoff? he asked. I'll let you know. We didn't get any chance to explore the place last time, Pete said. Spent too much time screwing around back at that pile of rocks. Watch it, Buster. 
Anyway, we had to get home for some party you were having, so we just drove right on through Sagebrush. God, Larry thought, he'd meant it literally. Otherwise, Barbara wouldn't have reacted that way. They'd actually screwed in that old ruin, inside those tumble-down walls, no door, no roof, right out in the open almost. For just a moment he was there, on top of Barbara. Her eyes were half shut, her lips peeled back, her naked body writhing under him as he thrust. He banished the image, ashamed of his minor betrayal and the desire it stirred. No harm in daydreaming, he told himself. He had such fantasies often, and not just about Barbara. But he'd never cheated on Jean. He planned to keep it that way. You're coming up on it, Barbara said. Pete slowed nearly to a full stop by the time he made the right-hand turn. The road ahead looked as if it had gone ignored by a generation of repair crews. Only a few faint traces remained of its center line. The gray, sun-baked asphalt was cracked, crumbling, pocked with holes. The van pitched and bounced, swerved to miss the worst of the potholes. Larry found himself hanging under the armrest. You want to slow down? Barbara suggested. You want to get there, don't you? In one piece, if that's feasible. A bump rammed the seat against Larry's rump. His teeth clashed. God damn it, Barbara snapped. Okay, okay. Didn't see that one coming. After he eased off the gas, the ride was still rough but not punishing. Larry relaxed his grip on the armrest. Looking out his side window, he saw the rusted-out hulk of an overturned car. Its roof was mashed in and it had no wheels. It was well beyond the embankment bordering the road, surrounded by the desert's litter of broken rock, by cactus and scrub brush. He couldn't imagine how it had come to be belly up. He considered mentioning the wreck, but decided to keep silent. The thing would probably inspire another story concept from Pete. No doubt a perfectly mundane explanation for how it got there. Maybe it broke down and was abandoned by the roadside. People had come along later, pushed it out there for the hell of it, and flipped it over. Had nothing better to do. If someone wanted to salvage the tires, rolling the thing probably seemed more sensible than jacking it up one corner at a time. Not just someone. Larry felt a quick rush of joy, a roving band of desert scavengers, a primitive, bloodthirsty pack. Maybe they don't just wait for breakdowns. Maybe they block the road or booby-trap it, then ambush the unlucky travelers. They slaughter the men, they take the women back to their lair. Maybe an abandoned mine, for fun and games. Not bad. Worth toying around with later to see if he could make it work. He needed a new idea, and soon. Just around the bend, Barbara said. Larry peered out the windshield, but the view ahead was blocked by low rocky slopes. The road curved through a gap between the desolate rises. Maybe I can work the ghost town into the scavenger idea, he thought as they entered the narrow pass. There she blows, Pete announced. Two. Along the road leading into Sagebrush Flat were the remains of shacks that had been picked apart by the desert winds. Houses of stone, adobe, and brick had fared better, but even those looked battered, their doors hanging open or gone, their windows smashed. Here and there boards lay scattered on the ground near doorways and windows. Larry supposed that the lumber had once been used to seal the dwellings. The weathered walls of the old houses were pocked with bullet holes, scribbled with sketches and messages in spray paint. Contributions from visitors to this dead town, making a playground of its carcass. Many of the yards were bordered by broken-down fences. Along with cactus and brush, Larry saw pieces of old furniture in front of some houses. A sofa, a couple of cane chairs, an aluminum lawn chair with its frame twisted crooked. One house had a bathtub off to the side. Another had an overturned bathroom toilet that looked as if it had been the subject of target practice. The rusted hood of a car was leaning against a porch. Nearby lay a couple of tires, and Larry recalled the abandoned, tireless car he'd seen a few minutes ago. Isn't exactly Beverly Hills, huh? Pete remarked. Love it, Larry said. Gee, and we forgot our spray cans, Jean said. How can we properly deface the place without our paint? We could shoot it up some. Pete reached beneath his seat and came up with a revolver. It was sheathed in a beltless holster. Larry recognized it as the three fifty seven Smith & Wesson that he'd fired a few times when they'd gone shooting last month. A beauty. Put that away, Barbara said. For God's sake. 
Just kidding around. Don't get your balls in an uproar. As he concealed the handgun under his seat, Barbara said, Men and their toys. Pete swung the van off the road and stopped beside a pair of gasoline pumps. He beeped the horn a couple of times as if signaling for service. God, Barbara muttered. Hey, wouldn't it be something if a guy showed up? Larry gazed past the pumps. The porch stairs led up to a country store with a screen door hanging by a single hinge. A faded wooden sign above the doorway identified the place as Holman's. A row of windows faced the road. Not a single pane was still intact. The window openings looked like mouths with sharp glass teeth. Might as well start here, Pete said. Great, Larry said. He thought it might be interesting to go through some of the houses they'd passed on the way in, but those could wait for another day. He was more eager to explore the downtown area. He climbed out of the van. The wind and heat hit him. Jean grimaced when she stepped down. The wind blew her hair back, made her blouse and skirt cling to the front of her slim body as if they were wet. Better lock up, Pete called. There's nobody around to steal anything, Barbara said. Would you rather I take the Magnum along? Okay, okay, we'll lock the doors. Larry took care of their side. They met Pete and Barbara in front of the van. I would feel better if we took the gun with us, Pete said. Well, I wouldn't. You never know about a place like this. If you think it's dangerous, we shouldn't be here. Barbara tossed her head to clear her face of blowing blonde hair. The wind parted her untucked blouse below the last button, and Larry glimpsed a triangle of tanned belly. Might be rattlers. Pete said. We'll watch our step, Jean told him. Like Larry, she was no doubt eager to end the gun debate before it could escalate into a quarrel. Yeah, Larry said, and if we run into any bad guys, we'll send you back here for the artillery. Oh, thanks, while you guys hide. You wouldn't mind, would you, honey? He answered by clamping a hand on Barbara's rump. The way she flinched and jumped away, he must have done it hard. She whirled toward him. Just watch it, huh? Let's see what's in Holman's, Jean said, and hurried toward the stairs. Larry went after her. Careful, he said. The boards, bleached pale, were warped and threaded with splits. The one before the top was broken in the middle, half gone and half hanging down by rusty nails. Jean held the railing, stepped over the demolished stair, and made it safely across the porch. While she dragged the screen door open, Larry climbed the stairs. They creaked under his weight but held him. You better not try it, Pete warned Barbara, looking back at her as he trotted up the old planks. You'll snap them like matchsticks. Give it a rest, she said. Larry admired her restraint. It seemed so damn stupid of Pete to poke fun at his wife's size. She was big, probably a shade over six feet tall. Though not a beanpole like many tall women, she certainly wasn't overweight. Larry had seen her in all kinds of attire, including swimsuits and nightgowns, and considered her body terrific. He knew that Pete was proud of her appearance. Pete was compact and powerful, but lifting all the weights in the world wouldn't give him the six inches of height he would need to meet Barbara eye to eye. Instead of calling him short stuff or pipsqueak, she'd simply told him to give it a break. Admirable. She climbed the stairs without bursting any of them. Inside, Holman smelled of dry, ancient wood. Larry expected the place to be stifling, but the shade and the breeze from the broken windows kept it bearable. A thin layer of sand coated the hardwood floor. It had blown into small drifts against the walls, the foot of the L-shaped lunch counter, and the metal bases of the swivel stools along the counter. The eating area occupied about a third of the room. There had probably once been tables between the counter and the wall, but they were long gone. Bet they served great cheeseburgers, Jean said. She was very fond of diners with character. To Jean, dumpy old places that many people would disparage as greasy spoons promised delights unattainable in clean and modern fast food chains. Shakes, Barbara said. I could go for one about now. I could go for a beer, Pete said. I think I saw a saloon up the road, Jean told him. But they only serve ghost light. Larry said. Let's break a few out of the van before we move on. You've got a beer? Larry could taste it. Surely you jest. The desert's one dry mother. You think I'd brave her without my survival stash? All right. Pete headed for the door. Aren't you going to look around? Barbara asked. 
What's to see? He hurried outside. I guess he's right, Jean said, scanning the room. The rest of it must have been a general store, Larry said. I bet they carried everything. Nothing remained, not even shelves. Except for the lunch counter and stools, the room was bare. Behind the counter was a serving window. Farther down, Larry saw a closed door that probably connected with the kitchen. Past the end of the counter was an alcove. That's probably where the restrooms were. I think I'll check out the ladies, Barbara said. Lots of luck, Jean told her. Can't hurt to have a look. She walked into the alcove, opened a door, and whirled away, clutching her mouth. Apparently, Larry said, it did hurt to take a look. Barbara scrunched up her face. You're a little green around the gills, Jean told her. She lowered her hand and took a deep breath. Guess I'll find a place around back. They left Holman's. She followed the porch, jumped off, and disappeared around a corner of the building. Larry and Jean went to the van. When Pete came out, he had four bottles of beer clutched to his chest. Where's Barb? Went behind the building. Answering a call of nature, Jean said. He scowled. She shouldn't have gone off by herself. She may not want an audience, Jean explained. Damn it. Barb, he yelled. No answer. He called again, and Larry saw a trace of worry in his eyes. She probably can't hear you, Larry said. The wind and everything. Take these, okay? I've got to make sure she's okay. Jean and Larry each took two bottles from his arms. She's only been gone a couple of minutes. Yeah, well... He hurried away, jogging toward the far end of Holman's. Hope he doesn't tear her head off, Jean said. At least he's worried about her. That's something, anyway. I sure wish they'd quit bickering. They must enjoy it. Jean wandered toward the road, and Larry stayed at her side. The bottles of beer felt cold and wet in his hands. He took a drink from the one in his right. You'll be having to go yourself if you don't watch it. Don't let Pete come to my rescue, he said, and turned his attention to the town. The central road had broad gravel shoulders for parking. The sidewalks were concrete, not the elevated planking common to such old west towns as Silver Junction, where they'd spent the morning. The citizens had made some modern improvements before leaving Sagebrush Flat to the desert. I wonder why they left, Larry said. Wouldn't you? I wouldn't live anywhere that doesn't have movie theaters. Well, I don't see any. Neither did Larry. From his position in the middle of the road, he could see the entire town. Not one of the buildings had a movie marquee jutting over the sidewalk. He saw a barber pole in front of one small shop, a place on the left with a faded sign that proclaimed it to be Sam's Saloon, about a dozen other enterprises altogether. He guessed that they'd once been hardware stores, cafes, possibly a bakery, clothing stores, maybe a pharmacy and a five and ten, a dentist's and doctor's office. And how about an optimistic realtor? And certainly a sporting goods store. Not even the smallest backcountry town in California was without a place to buy guns and ammo. Way at the far end of town, on the left, stood an adobe building with a pair of bay doors and service islands in front, Babe's Garage. The centerpiece of town appeared to be the three-story wood frame structure of the Sagebrush Flat Hotel, right next door to Sam's Saloon. That's the place I'd like to explore, Larry said. Sam's? That too, but the hotel. It looks like it's been around for a while. We'd better go there next, then. No telling how long this little expedition's going to last. Those two start fighting. We'll have to come back by ourselves sometime and really check the place out. I don't know. She drank some beer. I'm not sure I'd want to come here without some company. Hey, what am I, chopped liver? You know what I mean. He knew, though he and Jean shared a desire for adventure, they were limited by a certain timidity. The presence of another couple seemed to erase that weakness. They needed backup. Backup like Pete and Barbara. In spite of the bickering, each was endowed with self-confidence and force. Led by that pair, Larry and Jean were willing to venture where they wouldn't go on their own. Even if we'd known about this place, Larry thought, we wouldn't have dared to explore it by ourselves. The chance of a return trip, at least in the near future, was slim. Jean turned around and looked toward the corner of Holman's. I wonder what's keeping them. Should we go find out? I don't think so. Larry took a swig of cold beer. Why don't we get out of the sun, Jean suggested. 
They wandered back past the van, climbed the rickety stairs to Holman's shaded porch, and sat down. They rested the two extra beers on the wood between them. Jean crossed her legs. She rubbed her bare thighs with the base of her bottle. The wetness left slicks on her skin. She lifted the bottle to her face and slid it over her cheeks and forehead. Larry imagined Jean opening her blouse, rolling the chilled, dripping bottle against her bare breasts. She wasn't the kind of woman who would ever do that, though. Hell, she wouldn't even step out of the house unless she had a bra on. Too bad life can't be more like fiction, he told himself, and drank some more beer. A gal in one of his books would have that wet bottle sliding over her chest in about two shakes. Then, of course, the guy would get in on the action. That'd be a scene worth writing. You'll never get a chance to live it, not in this lifetime, but... Larry, I'm starting to get worried. They'll be along. Something must be wrong. Maybe she has a problem. Like the trots? Who knows? They'd be back by now if something hadn't happened, Jean said. Maybe Pete got lucky. They wouldn't do that. Obviously, they did it back at that old ruin we passed. Sounded like it, but they were alone. They wouldn't do that here with us waiting. If you're so sure, why don't we go around back and look for them? Go right on ahead. She gave him an annoyed glance. Nah. He put a hand on her back. Her blouse was damp. He untucked it and slipped his hand beneath it. She sat up straight and sighed as he caressed her. When he fingered the catches of her bra, she said, Don't get carried away. They could show up any second. On the other hand, maybe they won't show up at all. Don't kid around like that, okay? I'm not entirely kidding. Maybe they are screwing around. You said they wouldn't. Well, I don't know, damn it. Maybe we'd better go see. Jean wrinkled her nose. If they did run into trouble, Larry said, we aren't making matters any better by procrastinating. They might need help. Yeah, okay. Besides, their beers are getting warm. He picked up the bottle for Pete, stood and waited for Jean. Then they walked to the end of the porch. Larry peered around the corner. The area alongside the building was clear, so he leaped down. Jean covered the mouth of Barbara's bottle with her thumb and jumped. I don't know about this, she said. They can't expect us to wait forever. Larry led the way, wanting to be a few strides ahead of Jean in case there really was trouble. At times like this, he wished his imagination would take a holiday, but it never left him alone. It was always busy churning up possibilities, most of them grim. He pictured Pete and Barbara dead, of course, slaughtered by the same pack of desert scavengers he'd dreamed up when he saw the overturned car. Maybe Pete had been killed, Barbara abducted. We'd have to go looking for her, run back to the van first and get Pete's gun. Maybe they both got killed by a criminal using the old town as a hideout, or by an old lunatic on the lookout for claim jumpers. Maybe they'll just be gone, vanished without a trace. Pete has the keys to the van. We'd have to walk out of here. He supposed the nearest town was Silver Junction. God, it'd take hours to get there, and maybe someone would be after them, hunting them down. Better warn him we're coming, Jean said. He stopped near the corner of the building, looked back at her, and shook his head. If they ran into someone, don't even think it, okay? From the look on Jean's face, he could see that she'd already considered the possibility. Just go ahead and call out, she said. We don't want to barge in on something. Speak for yourself, he thought. If Pete was having at her, he wouldn't mind a glimpse of it, not at all. But he kept the thoughts to himself. Without looking around the corner, he yelled, Pete, Barbara, you all right? No answer came. A second ago, he'd pictured them rutting. Now he saw them sprawled dead, murderous savages hunched over their bodies, heads turning at the sound of his voice. He gestured for Jean to wait and stepped past the end of the building. Three. Where are they? Jean whispered, pressing herself against his side. Larry shook his head. He couldn't believe the couple was actually gone. They probably just wandered off somewhere, he said. The idea that he would catch them fooling around had been the product of wishful thinking, and he knew that his worries about murder had been far-fetched, but so had his worries that they'd disappeared. We'd better find them, Jean said. Good plan. But all he saw were the rear facades of the other buildings and the desert stretching away toward a ridge of mountains to the south. 
Maybe they're playing some kind of trick on us, Jean suggested. I don't know. Pete was awfully eager for his beer. People don't go for a leak and vanish off the face of the earth. Only on occasion. It's not funny. Her voice was trembling. Look, they've got to be around. Maybe we'd better go and get the gun. It's locked in the van. I don't imagine Pete would be very happy about a broken window. Pete! She suddenly shrieked. Barb! A distant voice called, Yo! Jean's eyebrows flew up, her head snapped sideways, and she squinted out at the desert. Some fifty yards off, Pete's head and shoulders rose out of the wasteland. Hey, you gotta see this, he shouted, and waved for them to approach. Jean glanced at Larry, rolled her eyes, and sagged as if her air had been let out. He grinned. I think I may kill them myself, Jean said. I'll go get the gun. Break all the windows while you're at it. Her voice sounded shaky. Come on, let's see what they found. It better be good. They walked over the hard-baked earth, moving carefully as they stepped on broken rocks, avoided clumps of cactus and greasewood. Near the place where Pete waited was an old smoke tree. Larry guessed that Barbara had wandered farther and farther away from Homans, looking for a suitably large bush or rock cluster, and had finally decided upon the tree. Its trunk was thick enough to afford privacy, and there was shade beneath its drooping branches. Pete was standing some distance from the tree. At his back, the ground dropped away. What did you find? Larry asked. The Grand Canyon? Hey, glad you brought the suds. He lifted the front of his knit shirt and wiped his face. It's nasty out here. Larry handed the full bottle to him. The depression behind Pete was a dry stream bed some fifteen or twenty feet lower than the surrounding flatlands. Barbara, sitting on a rock at the bottom, looked up and waved. Did you forget about us? Jean asked Pete. He finished taking a swig of beer, then shook his head. I was just on my way to get you. Figured you might want to see this. He started down the steep embankment, and they followed. We were getting a little worried, Larry said, watching his feet as he descended the rocky slope. Thought you might have fallen victim to a roving band of desert marauders. Yeah, that's a good one. Make a good story, huh? Barbara stood up and brushed off the seat of her white shorts. God, it's hot as a huncher down here, she said, as they approached. Her blouse was unbuttoned, its front tied, leaving her midriff bare. The knot was loose enough to leave a gap. Her bra was black. Larry saw the pale sides of her breasts through its lace. No breeze at all, she added. What's the big discovery? Jean asked, handing a beer to her. It's no big deal if you ask me. She tipped the bottle up. Larry saw a bead of sweat drop from her jaw, roll off her collarbone, and slide down her chest until it melted into the edge of her bra. Over here, Pete said. Come on. He led the way to a cut eroded into the wall of the embankment. There, lying in shadows and partly hidden by tangles of brush, was the demolished carcass of a jukebox. Must have come from that cafe, he said, nudging its side with his shoe. How'd it get all the way out here? Jean asked. Who knows? The thing's no good anyway, Barbara said. It's seen better days, Larry said, feeling a touch of nostalgia as he pictured it standing fresh and bright near the lunch counter in Holman's. He guessed that someone had dragged it out and used it for target practice. It would have made a tempting target, all decorated with bright chrome and plastic, if the shooter happened to be an asshole who took pleasure from destroying things of such beauty. After the box was blasted to smithereens, it had probably been shoved off the edge of the slope for the fun of watching it tumble and crash. Larry crouched beside its shattered plastic top. The rows of record slots were empty. The tone arm dangled from its mount by a couple of wires. Probably worth a few of grand, Pete said. Forget it, Barbara told him. He thinks we should take it with us. She's sure a beaut, Pete said. A Wurlitzer. Think you could get it working, Jean asked. Sure. He probably could, Larry thought. The guy's house was a museum of resurrected junk. Televisions, stereo components, a toaster oven, lamps, a dishwasher, and vacuum cleaner all once discarded as useless, picked up by Pete and restored to working order. You might get it playing again, he said, but it's too messed up to ever look like anything. 
Its chrome trim was dented and rusty. One side of the cabinet was smashed in. The speaker grills looked as if they'd been hit by shotgun blasts. And bullets had torn away at least half the square plastic buttons used for selecting tunes. You probably can't even get replacement parts for a lot of this stuff, he added. Sure would be neat, though. Yeah. Turning his head sideways, Larry blew dust and sand from its chart of selections. Bullets and shotgun pellets had ripped away some of the labels. Those that remained were faint, washed out by rainfall and years of pounding sunlight. Still, he can make out the names of many titles and artists. Gene crouched and peered over his shoulder. There's Hound Dog, he said. I fall to pieces. Stand by your man. God, I used to love that one, Gene said. Sounds like it's mostly shit-kicker stuff, Pete said. Well, here's the Beatles, Hard Day's Night. The Mamas and the Papas. Oh, they were good, Barbara said. This one's California Dreaming, Larry told her. Always makes me sad when I think about Mama Cass. All right, Larry grinned. The Battle of New Orleans, Johnny Horton. Man, I must have been in junior high. I knew that sucker by heart. There's Haley Mills, Jean said, her breath stirring the hair above Larry's ear. Let's get together. And look, Soldier Boy. Here's the Beach Boys, Surfing USA. Now we're talking, Pete said. Dennis Wilson, too, Barbara said. So many of those people are dead. Mama Cass, Elvis, Lennon. Jesus, this is getting depressing. Patsy Cline's dead, too, Jean told her. And Johnny Horton, I think, Larry said. What do you guys expect, Pete said. This stuff's all at least twenty, thirty years old. Barbara took a few steps backward, stumbled when her sneaker came down on a rock, but managed to stay up. Sweaty face grimacing, she said, Why don't we get out of this hellhole and look around town? That's what we came here for, isn't it? Might as well. Jean pushed against Larry's shoulder and rose from her squat. Let's see if we can lift this thing, Pete muttered. Oh, no, you don't, Barbara snapped. No way. You're not carting that piece of trash home with us. Uh-uh. Well, shit. If you want an old jukebox so bad, go out and buy one, for God's sake. Jesus, it's probably got scorpions in it. I think you'd better forget it, Larry said, rising to his feet. The thing's beyond saving. Yeah, I guess. Shit. He gave his wife a sour look. Thanks a heap, Barbara, dear. She ignored his remark and started climbing the slope. Below her rucked-up blouse, her back looked tawny and slick. The rear of her shorts was smudged with yellow dust from the rock where she'd sat. The fabric hugged her buttocks, and Larry could see the outline of her panties. A narrow band inches lower than the belt of her shorts, a skimpy triangle curving down from it. Jean, climbing behind her, was hunched over slightly. Her blouse was still untucked. It clung to her back, and the loose tail draped her rump. Pete was watching, too. Couple of good-looking chicks, he said. Not bad. You ever get the feeling they run our fucking lives for us? Only about ninety-nine percent of the time. Pete choked out a laugh, slapped Larry's arm, and took a long drink of beer. Guess we'd better be good little boys and go with them. He glanced back at the jukebox. He sighed. He shrugged. Adios. No more music for you, old pal. So much for that, Larry said, when he saw the padlocked hasp across the double doors of the Sagebrush Flat Hotel. Pete fingered the lock. Doesn't look very old. Maybe someone's living here, Barbara said. Hey, Sherlock, it's locked from the outside. What does that tell you? Tells me we'd be trespassing. Yeah, Jean said. The doors are locked. The windows are boarded. Somebody's trying to keep people out. Kind of sparks my curiosity. What about you, Lair? Sparks mine, too. But I don't know about breaking in. Who's going to find out? Pete turned away from the doors. He stepped off the sidewalk, bent over, and swept his head slowly from side to side in a broad pantomime of scanning the town's only road. I don't see anyone. Do you see anyone? We get the point, Barbara told him. I'll just mosey on over to the van. He started across the pavement, walking at an angle toward Holman's. What's he got in mind? Jean asked. God knows. Maybe he's planning to ram the doors open. That'd be rather drastic, Larry said. 
It's a matter of pride at this point, a challenge. Pete wouldn't be Pete if he let a little thing like a lock keep him out. Jean rolled her eyes upward. I guess this means we're going to explore the hotel whether we want to or not. Just consider it an adventure, Larry suggested. Yeah, right. Jail would be an adventure, too. Pete climbed into the rear of the van. A few seconds later, he jumped down, swung the door shut, and waved a lug wrench overhead. It had a pry bar at one end. In his other hand was a flashlight. He's really going to break in, Larry thought. Good Christ. Barbara waited until he was closer, then called. We've been having some second thoughts about this, Pete. Hey, what's life if you don't take a little chance now and then? Right, Lair? Right, he answered, trying to sound game. You're a lot of help, Jean muttered. Pete bounded onto the sidewalk, grinning and brandishing his tire iron. Got my skeleton key right here, he announced. Fits any lock. Anybody want to wait in the van, Barbara asked. Ah, pussy. Well, I guess I'd like to have a look around, Larry said. Good man. Pete gave the flashlight to Larry. Then he ran the wedge end of the bar behind the metal strap of the hasp. He yanked with both hands, throwing his weight backward. Wood groaned and split. With a sound like a small explosion, the staple burst out of the door, bolts and all. Well, that was a cinch. He shoved the bar under his belt, turned the knob on the right, and pulled the door open. I suppose we could always say we found it like this, Barbara muttered. You won't have to say anything. Half an hour or so will be long gone. If we don't get shot for trespassing. Ignoring her remark, Pete leaned into the doorway and called, Yoo-hoo! Anybody home? Larry winced. Here we come, ready or not. Cut it out, Barbara whispered, slapping the back of his shoulder. Nobody home but us ghosts, he said in a low, scratchy voice and turned around, grinning. Real cute. So who's coming in? I think we should all go in, or none of us, Larry said, hoping Pete wouldn't figure him for a pussy. I don't think we should split up. I'd be worried the whole time that something might happen to the gals while we're in there looking around. Good man, Barbara said, and patted his back. Guess you're right, Pete admitted. If they got themselves raped and murdered while we were in there, boy, would we feel like a couple of heels. Exactly. Real cute, Jean said, borrowing not only Barbara's phrase, but also her disdainful tone. What do you say? Barbara asked her. They'll hold it against us forever if they can't go in on our account. Admit it, Pete said. You're dying to come with us. Let's get it over with, Barbara said. Larry gave the flashlight back to Pete and followed him into the hotel. In spite of the closed doors and boarded windows, sand had found its way into the lobby. It made soft, scraping sounds under their shoes. We probably shouldn't leave the door open, Jean said. There was a tremor in her hushed voice. In case someone comes by. Without waiting for a reply, she closed the door, shutting out most of the daylight. Light still came in around the doors, spilled through cracks and knot holes, and the planks across the windows, pale, dusty streamers that slanted down to the floor. Pete turned his flashlight on, its beam pushing a tunnel of brightness into the gloom. He swept it from side to side. Boy, there's a lot to see in here, Barbara whispered. What a find. The lobby was bare except for a registration counter. On the wall behind the counter were cubby holes for mail or messages. Over to the left, a wooden staircase rose steeply toward the upper floors. Should we check in before we have a look around? Pete asked. Probably no vacancies, Larry whispered. A couple of real comedians, Jean muttered. Pete led the way to the counter, pounded its top, and said in a loud voice, How's a guy get some service around here? Creep, you want to hold it down? What's everybody whispering for? He vaulted the counter, dropped into the space behind it, and ducked out of sight. He reappeared, rising slowly, the flashlight at his chin, to cast weird shadows up his face. Where the beam touched him, his skin gleamed with sweat. Goofing off like a kid, Larry thought. But he sometimes pulled the same gag, especially around Halloween, more to amuse himself than to frighten Jean or Lane. They had come to expect such antics. The old flashlight on the face routine hadn't scared Lane since she was about two. It did make Pete look strange and menacing.
Larry knew that if he let his mind go with it, he would get a shiver. Mm, yes, Pete asked, pitching his voice high. May I help ze very travelers? God, it's hot in here, Jean whispered. A damn oven, Barbara said. Anything back there? Larry asked, carefully avoiding his friend's face. Only me and ze spirit of ze night clerk who hung himself many years ago. If we're going to look around, Jean said, why don't we? And get out of here. I'd like to have a look upstairs, Larry said. Wait, let me ring for ze bell, Captain. Oh, the hell with him, Barbara muttered. Come on. She turned around and headed for the stairs. Jean went after her and Larry followed. Barbara's legs and the bare part of her back were nearly visible in the darkness. Her white shorts and blouse, pale blurs, seemed to float above the floor on their own. Jean, in darker clothes, was a faint smudge in front of him. He heard Pete strike the floor and stride up behind him, sand crunching under his shoes. The flashlight beam flicked across the backs of the women, swung over to the staircase, and swept upward, skimming past balusters, tossing their long shadows against the wall. Midway up was a small landing. The remaining stairs rose to the narrow opening of the second-floor corridor. "'You don't want to go first, do you?' Pete asked in his normal voice as Barbara started to climb. If I wait for you, we'll be here all day. The light moved downward, gliding just above the stair treads, and something touched by the low edge of its aura winked like gold. A small, questioning breath of surprise came from Pete. The light skittered backward and down. Its bright center came to rest on a crucifix. Christ, he whispered. That's right, Larry said. The crucifix, directly below the landing, was attached to wood paneling that closed off the space beneath the staircase. What is it? Barbara asked, leaning over the banister near the bottom of the stairs. Somebody left a crucifix on the wall, Larry told her. Is that all? She leaned farther out, then shook her head. Big deal, she said. Jean stepped around the side of the staircase for a closer look. Anybody want a souvenir? Pete asked. He strode toward the crucifix. No, don't, Larry warned. Hey, somebody just forgot it here. Finders keepers. Leave it alone, Barbara said from her perch on the stairs. For God's sake, you don't go around stealing crosses. That's sick. The cross was made of wood. The suspended figure of Jesus looked as if it might be gold-plated. Pete reached for it. Please don't, Jean said. He looked at her. Oh, he said. Oh, yeah. Apparently, he had just remembered that Jean was Catholic. He lowered his hand. Sorry, I was just kidding around. Reason prevails, Barbara muttered. She pushed herself away from the banister and resumed climbing. She got as far as the landing. The wood creaked under her weight, then burst with a hard, flat crack like a gunshot. Barbara sucked in her breath. She flung her arms up as if trying to find a handhold in the dark air as she dropped straight down. Four. My God, Pete shouted. Jean, racing up the stairs, called out, Hang on. I'm slipping. Hurry. Larry dashed toward the foot of the stairs. He didn't hear Pete coming. Where are you, man? Get up there and grab her, Pete snapped. Oh, shit, Barbara groaned. Larry swung himself around the newel post. As he rushed up behind Jean, he saw the hazy glow of Pete's flashlight ahead and to the right of the stairs. Hadn't the guy moved? Was he still down there in front of the crucifix? Jean sank to her knees at the edge of the landing. Barbara, her back to the lower stairs, looked like someone being swallowed by quicksand. She was hunched forward, pressing her chest against the remaining boards, bracing herself up with her elbows. Jean crawled aside to make space for Larry, then hooked an arm under Barbara's left armpit. Gotcha, she gasped. I gotcha. You're not gonna fall. Are you okay? Pete called up. No, damn it. Larry dropped against the landing and stairs, looked down into a six-inch gap between the broken planks and the white of Barbara's blouse. Blackness. A bottomless pit, he thought, an abyss. Ridiculous, he told himself, probably no more than a six- or seven-foot drop, all told, from the landing to the lobby floor. She was already about halfway there. What if the floor doesn't extend under the staircase? Or she breaks through that, too. Even if she had only a four-foot fall, she would end up trapped under the staircase, and the broken boards might scrape her up pretty good on the way down. He squirmed forward until his face met the hair on the back of Barbara's head. He wrapped his arms around her. They squeezed her breasts. Muttering, sorry, he worked them lower and hugged her ribcage. 
Pete, he yelled. You got her? Pete's voice still came from below. Just barely, if you'd give us a goddamn hand. He heard a crack of splitting wood. For a moment he thought that more of the landing was giving out. Nothing happened, though. Yeah, Barbara yelped, jerking in Larry's embrace. Something's got me. It's just me, hon. For an instant, a pale tongue of light licked the darkness beside Larry's right shoulder. It had risen through the broken boards. Pete's under us, he realized. How'd you get down there? Jean asked. She sounded amazed, relieved. Tire tool magic, Pete said. Okay, I've got you, hon. Let's lower her gently. No, 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 don't. I'll fall. We gotta get you down out of there. Well, boost me up, okay? Her voice was controlled, but tight with pain or fear. If I try to go down, I'll get racked up even more. All right, we'll give it a try. You guys ready up there? On the count of three. You gonna push her up by her legs, Jean asked. That's the idea. One, two. Take it easy, Barbara urged him, or I'll end up with a bunch of wood in me. Okay, one, two, three. Barbara came up slowly through the break as if she were standing on an elevator. Still hugging her chest, Larry struggled to his knees. She swayed back against him. He slid a hand down the slick, bare skin of her belly. She gasped and flinched. Then he grabbed her belt buckle, yanked upward, pulled her heart against him, and she came to rest sitting at the brink of the gap. Okay, she gasped. I'm okay. Give me a second to catch my breath. Larry and Jean held onto her arms. All right up there? Pete asked. The beam of his flashlight swept back and forth through the break in front of Barbara's knees. Barbara didn't answer. She's safe, Jean called down. The beam slid away and only a faint glow drifted out of the opening. I want to go home, Barbara muttered. Larry and Jean held her steady while she leaned back and drew her legs up. She planted her shoes against the rim of splintered wood at the gap's far side. Jesus! Startled, scared. Barbara went rigid. Pete, what's wrong? Holy jumping! Oh, man! Not quite so scared now, amazed. Hey, you're not gonna believe this. Honest to mother and God. Larry, get down here. What? Barbara leaned forward and peered between her spread legs. What is it? You don't want to know. This is no time for games, Peter. You're just damn lucky you didn't wind up down here. For a moment, no one said anything. Then Pete's voice came up through the crevice. You would have had company. Shivers ran up Larry's back. There's an old stiff in here. He's kidding, Larry thought. But his body knew that Pete was telling the truth. His cheeks suddenly felt numb. He had trouble getting enough breath. His bowels went shaky. His scrotum shriveled up tight as if someone had just grabbed it with a handful of ice. Oh, geez, Barbara muttered. Jean and Larry got out of her way as she twisted around, grabbed the banister, and struggled to her feet. They followed her down the stairs. She held the railing and moved slowly, hunched over just a bit. Her blouse now hung all the way down her back. I knew I didn't like this place, Jean whispered. Barbara went straight to the hotel door and threw it open. Daylight fluttered in. She stopped in the doorway and turned sideways. She was squinting. Her teeth were bared. Though Larry was several feet away, he could see her trembling. Her hand shook as she pinched the edges of her blouse and spread its front wide. She gazed down at the raw band of skin across her belly. Her breasts looked very white through the open patterns of her bra. Larry glimpsed the darker skin of her nipples. She was too hurt and dazed for modesty, and Larry felt like a cheap voyeur taking advantage of her carelessness. In spite of the guilt, he didn't want to look away. There was a dead body under the stairs. Somehow, the sight of Barbara's skin through the black lace bra eased his sick dread. But he forced his eyes lower. The right leg of her shorts was rucked up higher than the left. Both thighs were scraped, her shins bleeding. The right was worse than the left, but both legs had been abraded in the fall. Jean went to her. You really did get racked up. You're telling me. Where is everyone? Pete called. His voice sounded muffled. Barbara's really banged up, Larry answered. Come on out of there and let's go home. You've got to see this. It'll just take a minute. I don't want to see it. Man, your wife is hurt. What's one more minute or two? We've got a dead body here. 
You're a writer for God's sake, a horror writer. I'm telling you, this isn't something you want to miss. Come on. Go ahead if you want, Jean told him. We'll start on over for the van. Larry wrinkled his nose. Barbara nodded, still grimacing and shaking. Her face and chest were shiny with sweat. Larry found himself looking again at her breasts. Go on, she said. It'll make him happy. You gals don't want to see it? You've got to be kidding, Jean said. Just make it quick, Barbara told him. He turned away from the door. He walked slowly across the lobby floor. Glancing back, he saw Jean and Barbara step outside. He felt abandoned. I don't have to be here, he thought. I could be out there with them. He did not want to see a damn corpse. But his weak legs kept moving him away from the sunlight. Alongside the staircase, a wide section of paneling had been ripped loose and gaped open a couple of feet. The glow of Pete's flashlight showed through the space. Larry turned sideways and stepped into the enclosure. Thought you were going to chicken out on me, Pete said. Can't miss a chance like this. He found Pete standing on a couple of boards that had fallen from the landing. He looked frozen there, back rigid, his right arm straight out, aiming the flashlight almost as if it were a pistol, aiming it at the coffin that was jammed head first against the underside of a low stair. The body was covered, at least to the neck, by an old brown blanket. The blanket was rumpled as if it had been tossed into the coffin by someone who didn't care to straighten it. The corpse had long yellow hair. The skin of its face looked tight and leathery. Larry saw sunken eyelids, hollow cheeks, lips that were stretched back in a mad grin that exposed teeth and gums. You believe this? Pete whispered. Larry shook his head. Maybe it isn't real. My ass, I know a stiff when I see one. Looks almost mummified. Yeah, guess we ought to check it out, huh? Shoulder to shoulder, they moved slowly forward. Pete kept his light on the corpse. Hideous, Larry thought. He'd never seen such a thing. His experience with bodies was limited to three open casket funerals. Those people had looked almost good enough to sit up and shake hands with you. This one looked as if it might want to sit up and take a bite out of you. Don't think that stuff, Larry told himself. The underside of the stairway slanted down in front of them. They had to duck as they stepped to the foot of the coffin. Pete sank into a squat and waddled in farther. Larry started in, crouching. But after one step, a sense of suffocation stopped him. The stairs seemed to be pressing down on him, wanting to shove him lower, to rub his face in the corpse. He dropped to his knees and reached out, ready to brace himself on the wooden edge of the coffin. Just before he touched it, he realized what he was about to do. He jerked his hands back and clutched his thighs. The blanket piled on top of the corpse didn't cover its ankles and feet. They were bare, the color of stained wood, and bones showed through the tight skin. The nails were so long that they curled over the tops of the toes. Larry recalled that hair and nails supposedly continue to grow after death. But he'd heard that that was just a myth. They only appeared to grow because the skin sank in around them. Bet it's been here a long time, Pete whispered. He reached over the side of the coffin. With his index finger, he brushed the corpse's forehead. Larry moaned. What's wrong? How can you touch it? No big deal. Try it. Feels like shoe leather. He drew his finger across a blonde eyebrow. Larry imagined Pete's finger sliding down the ridge of the eye socket, touching the lid, denting it, sinking into the second knuckle. Go on and touch it, Pete urged him. How are you going to write about this stuff if you don't experience it? Thanks anyway. I'll rely on my imagia. We changed our minds. He flinched at the sound of Barbara's voice. So did Pete. Pete's head slammed the underside of a stair. He cried, ah, ducked down close to the face of the corpse and grabbed the back of his head. Shit. Damn it, Barb. Sorry. Larry looked over his shoulder at the women and smiled. Though his startled heart was drumming, he was glad they were here. He felt as if some of the real world had come back. Guess you weren't kidding, Barbara whispered. Jesus, look at that thing. Yuck, was all Jean said. Barbara crouched over the end of the coffin. Jean stayed behind her and peered over her head. Didn't want us to have all the fun, Larry asked. That's about the size of it, Jean said, her voice hushed. Curiosity got the best of us, Barbara added. 
Then she reached into the coffin and touched the foot of the corpse. She's just like Pete, Larry thought. Whatever their differences, they're sure a set. I think I'm bleeding, Pete muttered. That makes two of us, Barbara said, still rubbing the dead foot. It's like the skin on a salami. Salami's oily, Pete told her. This is more like leather. Okay, we've seen it, Jean said. Everyone ready to go? Yeah, just about. Pete stopped rubbing his head, reached one arm down over the covered torso, and snatched off the blanket. Larry lurched backward on his knees, wishing to God he'd known this was coming. He'd already seen too much. Now the corpse was stretched in front of his face. It was naked. It was female. It had a wooden stake in its chest. Holy shit, Barbara whispered. Let's get out of here, Jean gasped in a high, tight voice. She didn't wait for a consensus. She bolted. Pete threw the blanket down. It landed in a pile, covering the blunt top of the stake, the corpse's flat breasts, and the slats of its ribs. Barbara leaned forward, grabbed a bit of the blanket, and jerked it down to cover the groin. Blonde pubic hair. Larry groaned. Then he was scurrying after Barbara. The white seat of her shorts was still smudged with yellow from the rock where she'd rested in the creek bed. Seemed like a century ago. Why did we do this? Larry followed her through the open section of paneling. Jean was still in the lobby. Her fists were clenched at her sides, and she was prancing as if she had to pee. Let's go, let's go, she gasped. Larry waited for Pete. Together, they pushed the slab of wood into place, shutting the door of the tomb. Pete backed away as if afraid to take his eyes off it. In the beam of his flashlight, the crucified body of Jesus gleamed. Five. Pete floored it out of Sagebrush Flat, and Barbara didn't say a word about the speed. Nobody said a word about anything. Larry slouched in the passenger seat, feeling dazed and exhausted. Though he stared out the windshield at the sunbright road and desert, he kept seeing the corpse and the stake in its chest, and the crucifix. It's behind us now, he told himself. We got away. We're all right. His body felt leaden. There was a shaky tightness in his chest and throat that seemed like a peculiar mix of terror, subsiding terror, and elation. He remembered experiencing similar sensations a few years earlier. On a flight to New York, the 747 had hit an air pocket and dropped straight down for a couple of seconds. Some of the passengers struck the ceiling. He and Jean and Lane, strapped in their seats, had been unharmed, but he'd felt this way afterward. Probably shock, he thought. Shock combined with great relief. He sensed that if he didn't keep tight control of himself, he might start weeping or giggling. This must be where they get the expression, scared silly. How's everybody doing? Pete asked, breaking the long silence. I want a drink, Barbara said. There's more beer in the ice chest. Not beer, a drink. Yeah, I could go for one myself, or three or four. We should be home in less than an hour. He glanced at Larry. You believe that back there? That was like right out of one of your books. He hasn't written any vampire books, Barbara said. You'd know that if you ever read them. Bet you will now, right? I think I'd rather forget about it. Same here, Jean said. God, that babe had a stake in her heart. We all saw it, Barbara reminded him. And how about that crucifix? I'll bet they put it there to keep her from getting out. He nodded, squinting at the road. You know, in case the stake fell out or something, to keep her from breaking through the wall. How would the damn stake fall out, Barbara asked, sounding a little bit annoyed by his musings. Well, you know, a rat could get in there. A rat might pull it loose. Something like that. Give me a break. There's no such thing as vampires, Jean said. Tell them, Larry. I don't know, he said. What do you mean you don't know? Well, there's plenty of legends about them. It goes way back. Back in the Middle Ages, a lot of poor jerks wound up buried at crossroads with their heads cut off and garlic stuffed in their mouths. Guess ours got off lucky, huh? Pete grinned at him. All she got was the old stake in the heart routine. She's not any vampire, Jean insisted. Somebody sure wasted her, though, Barbara said. That's right, Jean said. Has it occurred to anyone that we found a dead body? 
Pete raised his hand like a school kid. Me, he said. I caught that right off the bat. He chuckled. No pun intended. No, I mean, shouldn't we tell the police? She's got a point, Barbara admitted. So does our babe under the stairs, Pete said, laughing some more. A point right in her chest. Give it a rest, would you? This is serious business. We can't just find a body and pretend it never happened. Right. We'll just tell the cops we broke into a locked hotel. You broke into a locked hotel. Hey, you want to be married to a jailbird? We could make an anonymous call, Jean suggested. Just explain where the body is so they can go out and get it. Really, I mean, whoever she is, she deserves a decent burial. I wouldn't want it on my conscience, Pete said. What do you mean? They won't bury her with that stake in her chest. Some poor slob will pluck it right out. Next thing you know, he's a vampire cocktail. That's ridiculous, Jean muttered. Is it? Making an evil laugh, he grinned over his shoulder at her. Watch where you're driving, Barbara said. I don't think we should call the cops, Larry said. Even if we do it anonymously, there's still a chance we might get dragged into the situation. I don't see how, Jean told him. How do we know we weren't seen? Somebody might have driven through town and spotted the van while we were admiring the jukebox. Or the vampire, Pete added, and might have noticed the license plate number. Oh, there's a pleasant thought, Barbara muttered. You just never know. That's all I'm saying. Hey, somebody could have even been watching us from a window or something. Thanks, Peter. I really needed to hear that. Even if nobody did see us, Larry went on, we undoubtedly left physical evidence behind. Fingerprints, footprints, tire tread marks where the van drove over dirt. The police would probably treat the whole area as a crime scene. There's no telling what they might find. Next thing you know, they could be knocking on the door. We didn't kill her. Have you got an alibi? Pete asked, for the night of September 3rd, 1901. A pretty good one. I wasn't born yet. My parents weren't born yet. You think she's been dead that long? Barbara asked. Sure looked old to me. I have no idea when she might have been killed, Larry said. But I bet she hasn't been under the stairs there for much more than twenty years or so. I imagine she was put there after the hotel closed down. Why's that? Pete asked. The guests would have smelled her. Gross, Jean muttered. Well, it's true. Assuming she was put in there right after she was killed, people would have noticed the stink. She doesn't smell now, but... You're making me sick, Larry. Why do you say twenty years? Barbara asked. The jukebox. Aha, uh -huh. the oldies but goodies. I don't think any of the songs I noticed were much later than the mid-sixties. That's probably when Holman's went out of business. I figure the hotel might have closed its doors around the same time as Holman's. Makes sense, Barbara said. So you think the body was put under the stairs sometime after, say, sixty-five? It's just a guess. Of course, she could have been dead fifty years before somebody put her under the stairs. If that's the way it went, there's no telling how long she's been there. Yeah, Pete said. You eliminate the stink factor by having her someplace else while she's ripe. You could stick her under the stairs and nobody'd be the wiser. I don't see how it matters, Jean said. The thing is, she's dead. Who cares how long she's been under the stairs? Pete again raised his hand. I myself find it to be of more than passing interest. So are the cops, Larry added. I think it'd make a big difference in the way they look at the situation. If she's been dead half a century, and they have ways of figuring that stuff out, she's almost like an historical artifact. If she was only killed twenty years ago, they might very well start an active homicide investigation. That's right, Barbara said. Whoever put the stake in her could still be alive and kicking. Speaking of which, Pete said. He glanced at Larry, arched an eyebrow, and stroked his chin. Wait till you hear this one. We know, Barbara said. You did it. Hey, I'm being serious here. Anybody happen to notice anything odd about the front doors of the hotel? Aside from the fact that we were the first to break in, Barbara asked. Very good, hon. That's one thing. The place was still sealed when we got there. Just about every other joint in town was wide open. People'd busted in and done some exploring, but not the hotel. 
What else? Are we playing 20 questions? Is it bigger than a bread box? Here's a clue. Bright and shiny and brand new. The padlock, Larry said. The hasp. Right. The way those suckers looked, I'll bet they were sitting on the shelf of a hardware store a month ago. So, Jean asked, who put them on the doors? Who wanted to keep intruders out of the hotel? Could have been anyone, Larry answered. Right, and it could have been someone who hid a body under the stairs, someone who's still around and trying to make sure nobody stumbles onto his little secret. The same person who put the crucifix on the wall, Larry added. Right, sort of a guardian, a keeper of the vampire. It's more likely, Barbara said, that whoever put the lock on the doors doesn't know a thing about it. More interesting if he does, Pete told her. Maybe for you. Any chance we might stop talking about it, Jean suggested. I wish we'd never set foot in that damn hotel. You know, Pete said, we should have pulled the stake. You know what I mean? Just to see what happens. Nothing would have happened, Jean said. Who knows? He leered at Larry. Hey, want to turn around and go back and do it? No way. Aren't you curious? Not that curious. Just try turning the van around, Barbara warned, and I'll bite your neck. Pussy. Don't push it, Buster. It was your big idea that got me messed up like this. You could have stayed outside. Nobody was holding a gun to your head. Just shut up, okay? He cast a glance at Larry. His expression was somewhat amused. Guess I'd better shut up before I get her riled, huh? I would if I were you. Whatever happened to freedom of speech? Though the words were spoken quietly to Larry, they were aimed at Barbara. That freedom ends where my ears begin, she said. Pete grinned at Larry but said no more. He drove in silence. Larry looked out at the desert. He still felt a little lightheaded and nervous, but much better than before. He guessed that the discussion had helped putting words to it, sharing their concerns, especially the playful way Pete had turned the whole god-awful experience into a vampire story, and the bickering between Pete and Barbara. Their nice, normal, everyday quarreling, it all helped a lot. Leached the horror out of their encounter with the corpse, like throwing sunlight onto a nightmare. But his anxiety started to grow when they came to Mulehead Bend. Not even the familiar sights along Shoreline Drive were enough to dispel the dread that seemed to be swelling inside him. Pete drove slowly through the traffic, a few automobiles surrounded by the usual mix of off-road vehicles, campers, vans, pickup trucks, and motorcycles. The road was bordered by motels, service stations, banks, shopping centers, restaurants, bars, and fast food joints. Larry saw the bakery where he'd bought a dozen donuts early that morning. He saw the supermarket where Jean did her grocery shopping, the computer store where he regularly bought floppy disks, paper, and printer ribbons for his word processor, the movie theater where they had attended a horror double feature Wednesday afternoon. Every now and then he caught glimpses of the Colorado River just east of the business district. A few people were still out water skiing. He saw a houseboat. A shuttle boat was carrying passengers toward the casinos on the Nevada side of the river. All so familiar, so normal. Larry thought he ought to feel some relief in returning to home turf, leaving behind the strangeness and desolation of the back roads. But he didn't. It's splitting up with Pete and Barbara, he realized. He didn't want to part with them. He was afraid. Like a kid who'd been telling spooky stories with his friends and now had to walk home alone in the dark. I'm not a kid, he told himself. It's not dark. We just live next door. And I won't be going home alone. Jean will be with me, and Lane's probably back by now. Why don't you guys stick around for a while, Barbara suggested. We'll have some cocktails, get the dust out of our throats. Great, Larry told her, wondering if she too was reluctant for the group to break up. I'll make my famous margaritas, Pete said. Sounds good to me, Jean said. Larry felt blessed. Pete left the traffic of Shoreline Drive behind and steered up the curving road to Palm Court. When he turned onto Palm, their houses came into view. It was good to be getting home. Lane appeared from beside the porch. She wore cut-off blue jeans and her white bikini top and carried a plastic bucket. Apparently she was preparing to wash the Mustang. 
Pete beeped the horn as they approached. Lane turned to them and waved. Let's not say anything to her about the you-know-what, Jean said. Mum's the word, Pete said. He pulled into his driveway and stopped. Climbing from the van, he called to Lane. Feel free to do this one when you get through over there. Hardy har Have fun shopping? Jean asked her. Yeah, it was okay. She beamed at Larry as he stepped past the front of the van. I spent all kinds of your money, Dad. You're going to have to stay home and write like a dog. Thanks a lot, sweetheart. Consider me a motivating force. So, how was the excursion? Had a good time, Jean told her. We'll be over here for a while. Join us if you'd like, Barbara said, appearing behind the van with the ice chest in her hand. Geez, Lane blurted, what happened to you? Had a little accident. Are you okay? she asked, frowning. Just some scrapes and bruises. I'll live. Wow. Come on over if you'd like. We'll be having some drinks and snacks. Thanks anyway. I want to wash the car. Well, if you change your mind. Sure, thanks. They entered the house. The air conditioning felt cool and good after the brief walk through the heat. Larry sat in his usual chair at the kitchen table. Jean sat across from him. Pete began to gather bottles from the liquor cupboard. It was all very familiar, very comforting. I'm going to get cleaned up a bit, Barbara said. Back in a minute, then I'll dig up some goodies. Pete sang a few lines of Margaritaville as he dumped tequila and triple sec into his blender. The blender was one of his finds. Someone had put it out for the trash men. He'd spotted it while driving to work, picked it up, and restored it to working order. It reminded Larry of the jukebox down in the creek bed. He saw himself crouching over it, and then he was on his knees beside the coffin, staring in at the withered brown corpse. He felt himself start to shrink inside. It's history, he told himself. We're home. It's all over. That damn thing is fifty, sixty miles away. Sure is good to be here, he said. Better than a sharp stick in the eye, or in the heart, as the case may be. Jean grimaced. Pete split open a couple of limes and squeezed them into the blender, then tossed in some ice cubes. He took long-stemmed margarita glasses down from the cupboard, rubbed their rims with lime, then dipped them into a plastic tub of salt. Okay, baby, do your stuff, he told the blender, as he capped it and pressed a button. After a few noisy seconds, the machine went silent. Pete filled the glasses with his frothy concoction and carried them to the table. As he sat down, Barbara returned. Are you okay? Jean asked. Feeling a lot better. She looked a lot better, too. She was barefoot, wearing red gym shorts and a loose gray T-shirt that was chopped off just below her breasts. Larry guessed that she had taken a washcloth to her legs and belly. The filth and blood were gone, leaving her skin ruddy around the abrasions. The wood had scratched her like an angry cat, and there were broad scuffs that looked as if she'd been given swipes with some heavy-duty sandpaper. Larry watched as she put together a tray of cheese and crackers. The back of her looked fine, tanned, smooth, unblemished. She brought the snacks to the table and sat down. Pushing out her lower lip, she huffed a breath that stirred the hair on her forehead. At last, she said. Pete raised his glass. May the vampire rest in peace and never come looking for our necks. I'm going to brain you, Barbara said. I'll help, Jean said. Pete grinned at Larry. These gals, they've got no sense of humor. 6. Larry woke up shivering. The covers were off him, twisted around Jean as she thrashed and whimpered. He shook her gently by the shoulder. She flinched, gasped. What's... what's... You are having a nightmare, Larry whispered. Huh? Oh, okay. She rolled onto her back. She was still panting for air. Smothering, she muttered, and struggled to free herself from the blankets. She shoved and kicked them down to the foot of the bed. I'm going to need some of that, Larry said, sitting up. Huh? Oh, sorry. No problem. I'll put some light on the subject, he warned, and gave Jean a moment to shield her eyes before he reached to the nightstand and turned on the lamp. Wait, I'll do it. You'll mess it up. Fine, he said, and smiled.
Seconds ago, Jean had been in the grips of a terrible nightmare. Now she was concerned that he might foul up the job of arranging the sheet and blankets. He leaned back, bracing himself up with locked arms, and watched her climb off the bed. She looked as if she'd just taken a shower with her nightgown on. Her short hair was matted down, wet ringlets clinging around her ears and the nape of her neck. The sleek white fabric of her nightie was glued to her back and rump. "'You're drenched,' Larry said. "'Must have been a real corker.' "'Probably. I don't remember.' She bent over her side of the bed and pulled the top sheet out of the tangle. Her breast swayed slightly inside the low-cut lace bodice. "'You think it was about today?' "'Wouldn't be surprised.' She swept the sheet high. As it fluttered down, Larry leaned forward and caught the edge. He drew it over his naked body and eased backward onto the mattress. The sheet was enough to block out the chill of the soft night breeze. But the lightweight blanket felt even better as Jean covered him with it. She smoothed it carefully over her side of the bed, then came around to his side. Bending over him, she straightened the blanket. He slipped his arm out and stroked her rump. The nightgown felt silken and damp. Her skin was smooth beneath it and very warm. She glanced at him, eyebrows rising. He moved his hand down the back of her leg and slipped it under the hem of her nightgown. Standing up straight, Jean reached out and turned off the lamp. Her gown, pale in the faint light from the window, climbed her body and fell away. Larry swept aside the sheet and blanket that she had just finished arranging so neatly, but she didn't protest. She crawled onto the bed, straddled his legs, and eased down on top of him. As they kissed, he caressed her back and her small, firm buttocks. She lifted her legs onto his. She pressed his growing penis between her thighs and squirmed against him. Her breasts were warm, slick cushions rubbing his chest, and though the feel of her writhing body made him ache with need, her hip bones felt as if they were grinding into him. He rolled, tumbling her onto the mattress, covering her with his body. He pushed himself up with elbows and knees to keep his weight off her. She squirmed as he kissed the side of her neck, moaned as he moved lower and kissed one nipple, then the other. He pushed himself back. Kneeling between her open legs, he whispered, Just a second. Jean's fingers curled lightly around him, slid the length of his shaft. I don't think you'll need one tonight. You sure? Yeah. Great. I hate those damn rubbers. I know. She smiled. Bright teeth and a faint blur of face, patches of darkness where her eyes should be. Larry was suddenly under the stairway again, kneeling over the corpse. He felt himself go cold and tight. Don't think about it. He realized that Jean was about the same size as the horrible dried-up thing. Stop it. What's wrong, honey? Nothing, he said. Her shadowed skin was dark, but not that dark. Her breasts were mounds, not slabs, but even in the dim light he could see the contours of her ribs. Below the rib cage she seemed shrunken in. Her hip bones jutted. Honey? Her hand felt leathery around his small, soft penis. Its hand. He pictured himself knocking it away. But he knew that this was Jean. She hadn't turned into the corpse. He wasn't hallucinating either. This was just Jean, and his damned imagination was simply messing with him. Not going to let it win, he promised himself. He scooted backward on the mattress. Her hand went away from him. He kissed her belly, warm, soft, slick with sweat, not dry and leathery. Stop comparing. But when his face rubbed Jean's moist curls, he remembered the thing's blonde thicket of pubic hair. A shudder passed through him. Jean thrust fingers into his hair. He went lower. She writhed and moaned, thrusting herself against him, clenching his hair, and he lost all thought of the corpse. Soon she was whimpering. But not from any nightmare, Larry thought, as she tugged his hair and he scurried up the mattress. He clamped his wet mouth to hers. He ran the hard length of his penis into her heat. She seemed to suck him in as if she were hungry to be filled. I should have nightmares more often, she told him later. Yeah. She was panting beneath him, lightly stroking his back. Then she turned her face away, worked her lips strangely, and raised a hand to her mouth. With her thumb and index finger, she pinched something and pulled it out. What's that? A hair. Where'd that come from? Your mouth, she said, shaking under him as she chuckled. 
She rubbed her hand on the sheet, then wrapped her arms around Larry and gave him a powerful squeeze. It was as if the hug used up the last of her strength. After a moment, she released him and sprawled out limp. Then he eased away, sliding out of her. He pulled the sheet and blanket up and scooted closer to her. He rested a hand on the warm curve of her thigh. Under his fingertips was a smear of stickiness. Ooh, yuck, he said. She laughed softly. Don't complain, Buster. I've got the wet spot. Want to trade places? It's my wifely duty to sleep on the wet spot. Her hand covered his, caressed it, fooled with his fingers. In the silence, he began to worry that Jean might ask about his problem. He doubted that she would, though. Their sex life was something they rarely discussed. Besides, he'd made a rather spectacular recovery. Well, he said, I'd better go to sleep or I won't be worth a damn tomorrow. You'll have to write like a dog to pay for Lane's new wardrobe. Put out the store, he muttered, rolling away from Jean and curling up on his side. She laughed, then surprised Larry by snuggling against him. Normally they slept at opposite sides of the bed. But it felt good, her breath warm on the nape of his neck, her breasts and belly pressing his back, her lap against his rump, the soft tickle of her pubic hair, her thighs smooth against the backs of his legs. An arm came down over his side, and fingers curled tenderly around his penis. "'You still horny?' he asked. She kissed his back. Wise guy, I just want to be close to you. Well, I guess that's all right. Thanks. Are you okay? I don't know, she whispered. I guess so. How about you? I wish we hadn't gone there today. Me too. I've never seen anything so horrible. She pressed herself more tightly against him. On the other hand, you're always looking for material. I could do without that sort of material. The real thing's too much for you, huh? She teased. Darn right it is. Your fans would be appalled, you know, if they ever found out how squeamish you really are. Nasty Lawrence Dunbar, master of gore. Pussy. Pussy, huh? You've been around Pete too much. She laughed again. Go to sleep, tough guy. Going for it. Seven. Happy trails to you, Dad said, and swatted her butt as she stepped out the door. She smirked back at him. Say hi to Roy and Dale, he added. You should look so good, Lane said, then turned away and hurried toward the car. The red Mustang gleamed in the early morning sunlight. She stepped around to the driver's side, feeling fresh and eager in her new clothes. The mottled pink and blue T-shirt, the tie-dyed blue denim jumper with its white lace trim and pink flower-bud decorations on the bib, straps, and hem, and the white fringed boots. Dad was always poking fun at her clothes. She supposed this outfit did make her look like a cowgirl. One hot radical cowgirl, she thought, and grinned as she climbed into the car. At least he hadn't made any remarks about the length of the skirt. Sitting down, she could feel the seat upholstery high on the backs of her legs. As she waited for the engine to warm up, she leaned close to the steering wheel and looked down. The skirt was short all right. Any shorter might be embarrassing. This was just right. Sexy, but not outrageous. She especially liked the lace around the hem of the skirt, the way its long points lay like frilly spearheads against her thighs. I'm going to drive Jim nuts when he sees me in this. As if he needs any help along those lines. Laughing softly, trembling just a little with the anticipation of being at school on such a fine day in such a grand outfit, Lane backed out of the driveway. She turned the car radio to 86.2 a.m. All the best in country 24 hours a day. Randy Travis was on. She turned the volume high and poked her elbow into the warm stream of air rushing past her window. God, she felt great. Seemed almost criminal to feel this great. She leaned her shoulder against the door, tipped her head, and felt the wind caress her face, tug at her hair. To think that she'd put up such a fuss about leaving Los Angeles. She must have been crazy, wanting to stay in that lousy apartment in a city full of filthy air and creeps. But she'd grown up there. She was used to it. She'd known she would miss her friends and the beaches and Disneyland. This was so much better, though. 
She'd made new friends. She loved the river, and the clean open spaces gave her a constant sense of freedom that made each day seem rich with promise. Best of all, she supposed, was the release from fear. In L.A. you had to be so careful. The place was crawling with rapists and killers. Not a day went by when the TV news didn't broadcast stories of such horror and brutality that you dreaded stepping outside. Kids missing. Their bodies usually found days later, nude and mutilated and sexually abused. Not only kids, either. The same thing happened to teenagers and even adults. If you weren't kidnapped and tortured, you might be gunned down at a restaurant or movie theater or shopping mall. And hiding at home was no guarantee of safety, either. There were plenty of nuts who simply drove around town, shooting into the windows of houses and apartment buildings. Nowhere was safe. Lane's joy slipped away as she suddenly remembered the chopping crashes of gunfire in the night. They had been home in their ground-level apartment in Los Angeles, sitting close together on the sofa, watching Dallas on TV. Lane had a tub of popcorn on her lap. Mom sat on one side, Dad on the other. All three were reaching in, hands sometimes colliding. The first blast made her jump so hard that the tub flew up, flinging popcorn everywhere. Then the night exploded as if someone on the street had opened up with a machine gun. Mom had screamed. Dad had shouted, Get down! but didn't give Lane even an instant to respond before he grabbed the back of her neck and nearly broke her in half as he rammed her forward. The edge of the coffee table skinned the top of her head. She wept and held her head and shuddered as the roar pounded her ears. Then all she heard was a ringing. The gunfire had stopped. Dad still clutched her neck. Jean? he'd asked in a high, strange voice. Mom didn't answer. Jean! True panic. Then Mom had said, is it over? They stayed on the floor. Then came sirens and the loud whap, whap, whap of a police helicopter low overhead. The front draperies were bright with flashes of red and blue. Dad had crawled to the window and looked out. Holy Jesus, he said. There must be twenty cop cars out there. It turned out that the shots had been fired at a family in a duplex across the street. Both parents and three children had been killed by automatic fire from an Uzi. Only an infant had survived the shooting. Lane hadn't known the family. That was another thing about L.A. Even most of your neighbors were strangers. But the fact that they'd been gunned down right across the street was shocking. Just too damn close. Dad had reminded them about a family gunned down by mistake a few years earlier. It was a drug hit. The killers had gone to the wrong house, the one next door to the residence of their intended victims. We're getting out of here, Dad had said, even while the street outside was still jammed with police cars. Two weeks later, they were on the way to Mulehead Bend. They knew the town from having vacationed there just a month before the shooting. They'd spent a night in a motel, followed by a week in a houseboat on the river. They'd all enjoyed the area, it was fresh in their minds, and it seemed like a good place to find sanctuary from the mad, crowded hunting grounds of Los Angeles. Sometimes the wind and heat were enough to drive you crazy. You had to watch out for scorpions and black widow spiders, and several varieties of poisonous snakes. But the chances of catching a bullet in the head or getting abducted by a pervert were mighty slim. Lane looked upon L.A. as a prison from which she and her family had escaped the freedom was glorious. She swung her car onto the dust and gravel in front of Betty's place and beeped the horn once. Betty lived in a mobile home, as did the majority of Mulehead Bend's population. It was firmly planted on a foundation. A porch and an extra room had been added on. It looked pretty much like a normal house from the outside, though the interior always seemed narrow and cramped when Lane visited. Betty trudged down the porch stair as if laboring under the burden of her weight which was considerable. She managed to raise her head and nod a greeting. Leaning across the passenger seat, Lane opened the door for her. Betty swung her book bag into the back seat. The fabric of her tan shirt was already dark under the armpits. The car rocked slightly as she climbed in. She shut the door so hard that Lane winced. "'Well, look at you,' Betty said, her voice as slow and somber as always. "'What did you do, mug Dolly Parton?' Who'd you mug, Indiana Jones? Yucca, yucca, she muttered. Lane stared onto the road. We picking up Henry? Only if you want to. Well, is he expecting us? I suppose. 
You two aren't fighting again, are you? Just the usual grief about my culinary preferences. I told him he's no prize himself, and if he thinks he can do better, he should go ahead and try in good riddance. True love, Lane said. She swung around a bend and accelerated up the road to Henry's house. He was out in front, sitting on a small, white-painted boulder next to the driveway, reading a paperback. When he saw them coming, he slipped the book into his leather briefcase. He stood up, ran a hand over the top of his crew cut, and stuck out his thumb, as if hoping to hitch a ride with strangers. What a dork, Betty muttered. Oh, he's cute, Lane said. He's a nerd. That was a fact, Lane supposed. In his running shoes, old blue jeans, plaid shirt and sunglasses, he could almost pass for a regular guy. But the briefcase gave him away. So did the rather dopey, cheerful look on his lean face, and the way his head preceded the rest of his body made him look to Lane like an adventurous turtle. He was a nerd, no doubt about it, but Lane liked him. Good morning, sports fans. Yo, Lane greeted him. Betty climbed out, shoved the seat back forward, and ducked into the back seat. Henry got in after her. Hanging over the seat, he managed to pull the door shut. Then his head swiveled toward Lane. Foxy outfit there, lady. Thanks. She had a body like a mountain road, he said, full of curves and places you'd like to stop for a picnic. Mike Hammer? Lane asked. Mac Donovan. Dead low tide. He dropped backward or was yanked by Betty. You never talk to me that way, the girl grumbled. He whispered something that Lane couldn't hear over Ronnie Millsap. She turned the radio down and heard a giggly squeal from Betty. Making a U-turn, she headed down the hill. So, you have a big weekend? Henry asked after a while. Okay, Lane said. Nothing special. I went shopping yesterday. No dream date with Jim Dandy, king of the studs? He had to go out of town with his parents. Too bad. And I bet he didn't even have the courtesy to leave you his biceps. Nope, I had to go without. Rotten luck. Should have come to the drive-in with us. Saw a couple of dynamite films. Trashed and Attack of the SS Zombie Queens. Sorry I missed them. Sorry I saw them, Betty said. Well, you didn't see much of them, that's for sure, between your forays to the snack bar and the john. Hush up. We think she got a bad hot dog, he explained. Henry, she whined. On the other hand, could have been a bad burrito or cheeseburger. Lane doesn't want to hear all the gruesome details. What's going on with your dad? Henry asked, leaning forward and holding his arms over the seat back. Have they started filming The Beast? Not yet. They just renewed the option, though. Terrific. Man, I can't wait to see that one. I've got rubber bands holding that book together. Read it five, six times. It's a classic. I would have liked it better, Lane said, if it hadn't been written by my father. Ah, he's cool. And apparently somewhat demented, Lane added. Henry laughed. At the bottom of the hill, Lane turned onto Shoreline Drive. Most of the shops along the road weren't open yet, and the traffic was light. The station wagon ahead of her was filled with children on their way to the elementary school, which was across the road from Buford High at the south end of town. Quite a few older kids were on the sidewalks, hiking in that direction. Henry, still resting on the seat back, swung his arm toward the passenger window. Isn't that Jessica? Lane spotted the girl on the sidewalk ahead. Jessica, all right. Even from behind, there was no mistaking her. The spiked hair, dyed bright orange, was enough to give her away. Her left arm was in a cast. Wonder what happened, Lane muttered. Anyone mind if I offer her a lift? Yeah, do it, Henry said. Terrific, Betty muttered. Lane swung the car to the curb, not far behind the swaggering girl, and leaned across the passenger seat. How about a ride, she called. Jessica turned around. Lane winced at the sight of her. God, Henry muttered. Jessica was generally considered the foxiest gal in the junior class, maybe in the entire high school. Not so foxy now, Lane thought. From the looks of her now, she might have gone ten rounds over the weekend with the heavyweight champ. The left side of her face was swollen and purple. Her cracked lips bulged like sausages. 
She had a flesh-colored bandage on her chin, another over her left eyebrow. Lane guessed that the pink-framed sunglasses concealed shiners. The girl usually wore huge dangling rings in her pierced ears. Today the lobes of both ears were bandaged. The low neckline on her tank top revealed bruises on her chest. Others showed around her shoulder straps. Even her thighs were smudged with purple bruises below the frayed edges of her cut-off jeans. How about it? Lane called to her. She shrugged, and Lane heard a quiet intake of breath from Henry, likely at the way the gesture made Jessica's breast move under the tight, thin fabric of her top. Only one showed. The other was discreetly hidden under the cloth sling that supported her broken arm. The visible one jiggled as she stepped toward the car. Maybe she got herself gangbanged. Nice, Lane. Real nice. Would have been her own damn fault. Cut it out. Leaning across the passenger seat, she unlatched the door and swung it open. Thanks, Jessica said. Henry dropped away from the seat back, no doubt with Betty's help, and lost his chance to watch the girl climb in. Too bad, Lane thought. He would have enjoyed seeing Jessica's leg come out through the slit side of her jeans. The bruises might have dampened his enthusiasm, but not by much. She pulled the door shut. Lane checked the side mirror, waited for a Volkswagen to pass, then swung out. Are you sure you want to be going to school? she asked. Shit, would you, if you looked like this? I guess I'd probably call in sick. Yeah, Jessica replied through her split and swollen lips. Well, better than having by old lady in my face all day. She's such a bane. Lane rubbed her lips together, licked them. Listening to Jessica was almost enough to make them ache. From the back seat came Betty's voice. So you're going to let us in on it, or do we have to guess? Scowling, Jessica peered over her shoulder. It's none of our business, Lane said. Yeah, well, I got trashed. Who did it to you? Henry asked. Who the buck knows? A couple guys? Real asswipes. Beat the shit out of me and stole my purse. Where'd it happen? Over back of the quick stop. Behind the quick stop? Betty asked. What were you doing there? They dragged me there. Saturday night. I went in, bore cigarettes, and they got me when I came out. Bad news, Henry muttered. Yeah, I'll say. With one hand, she opened a canvas satchel and took out a pack of camels. She shook it, raised the pack to her mouth, and caught a cigarette between her fat, scabby lips. She lit it with a bick, inhaled deeply, and sighed. Did they catch the guys who did it? Lane asked. Jessica shook her head. I didn't think stuff like that happened around here. It happens, all right. Lane pulled into the student parking lot, found an empty space, and shut off the car. Thanks a lot for the ride, Jessica said. Glad to help. I'm awfully sorry you got messed up. Me too. So long. She climbed out and headed away. Wouldn't you just die to know what really happened, Betty said. You think she lied? Lane asked. Let's put it this way. Yes. Henry shoved the seat back forward. Why would she lie about a thing like that? Why wouldn't she? 8. Larry drank coffee and read a new Sean Hudson paperback for an hour after Lane went off to school. Then he set the book aside, said, I'd better get to it, and rose from his recliner. Have fun, Jean told him, glancing up from the newspaper as he strode past her. He shut his office door and sat down in front of the word processor. He had already decided not to work on Night Stranger today. The book was going well. Two more weeks should take care of it. Then what? Ah, he thought, there's the rub. Normally, by the time he was this close to finishing a novel, the next was pretty well set in his mind. He would already have pages of notes in which he had explored the plot and characters, and have several of the major scenes worked out. Not this time. Gotta get cooking, he told himself. When the day came to write The End on Night Stranger, he wanted to slip a fresh floppy disk into his computer and begin Chapter One of whatever. Two weeks to go. That should be plenty of time. You'll come up with something. You'd better. 
Eighty, ninety pages to go. Then he would find himself facing an empty disk, a void, a taunting blank that would push him to the edge of despair. It had happened a few times before. He dreaded going through a period like that again. I won't, he told himself. He formatted a new disk and brought up its directory. 321,536 bytes to play with. Let's just use up a couple thousand today, he thought. A page or two, that's all it'll take. Maybe. He punched the Enter key, and the screen went blank. A few seconds later, he had eliminated the right margin justification, which would have left odd spaces between the words, spaces that drove him nuts when he tried to read the hard copy. He punched a few more keys. Novel Notes. Monday, October 3rd, appeared in amber light at the upper left-hand corner of the screen. Then he sat there. He stared at the keyboard. Several of the keys were grimy. The filthy ones were those he used least often. The numbers, the space bar, except for a clean area in the shape of his right thumb, some keys at the far sides that could apparently be used to give commands for a variety of mysterious functions. He didn't know what the hell half of them did. Sometimes he hit one by mistake. The consequences could be alarming. He spent a while cleaning the keyboard, scratching paths through the gray smudges with a fingernail. Stop screwing around, he told himself. He scraped Saturday's ashes out of a pipe, filled it with fresh tobacco, and lit it. The matchbook came from the Sir Francis Drake on Union Square. They'd had lunch there during a vacation along the California coast two summers ago. The vacation he thought of as the Wharf Tour. He set the matchbook down, puffed on his pipe, and stared at the screen. Novel Notes, Monday, October 3rd. Okay. His fingertips tapped at the keys. Come up with something hot, original and big. Try for at least five hundred pages, more if possible. Right. That accomplished a lot. He typed in, How about a vampire book? Ha, ha, ha. Forget it. Vampires are done to death. Need something original. Some kind of a new threat. Good luck, he thought. How about a sequel, he wondered. Maybe a sequel. The Beast 2 or something. Worth considering if you can't turn up anything better. Come on, something new. Or a new variation on an old theme. Nobody but Brander's done anything decent with werewolves. Come up with a fresh werewolf gimmick? Forget it. That TV show's got the whole thing covered. But that's not a book. Larry scowled at the screen. Forget werewolves. What else is there? His pipe slurped. He twisted the stem off, blew a fine spray into the wastebasket beside his chair, put the pipe back together, and lighted it again. A few minutes later, he had a list. Werewolves. Ghosts. Boring. Zombies. Aliens. Miscellaneous. Beasts. Demonic possession. Shit. Homicidal maniac. Done to death. Curses. Wishes granted. Monkey's paw. Possessed machinery. King's realm. Crazed animals. See above. And birds. Haunted house. Possibilities. How about a haunted house book, he wrote. He'd always wanted to do one, and always reached the same stumbling block. By and large, he didn't consider ghosts sufficiently scary. Something else had to be in the house. But what? That question took him back to the list. He stared at it for a long time. Something horrible inside the house, he wrote. But what? How about a vampire under the staircase? Right. Just thinking about it made his insides crawl. He was on his knees beside the coffin again, staring at the withered corpse, feeling fear and disgust. He wanted to forget he ever saw the thing, not spend the next few months dwelling on it. Would make a good story, though. A blonde corpse under the hotel stairs, he wrote. A stake in its chest. Found by some people exploring a ghost town. Could tell it just the way it happened. Fun and games. He wrinkled his nose. But they don't run off scared shitless like we did. Maybe some of them do, but one is fascinated. Is this a vampire, or isn't it? A character like Pete, but a little crazier. He has to know. 
so he pulls the stake. Right in front of his eyes, the thing comes back to life, changes from a hideous brown cadaver, use Barbara's line about looking like salami, into a gorgeous young woman. A gorgeous, naked young woman. Pete character is enthralled, and turned on, he wants her, but she has a different idea and bites his neck. They don't come out and don't come out. The others get worried, go back into the hotel to see what's keeping the guy. Nobody under the stairs. The coffin is empty. Little problem, bud. Vampires don't screw around in the daytime. So how come our merry band is exploring a ghost town after dark? Easy. They're driving through town, on the way home from an outing in the desert, and the van breaks down. Flat tire or something. Ah, he thought, the old car breaking down in just the worst possible place gag. It could work, though. And it had a nice bonus. That wasn't the way things happened yesterday. Make it different enough from the truth, he typed, and maybe you can handle it. How about taking one big step and changing what's under the stairs? Not a dead gal with a stake in her chest, but a... A what? A crate with a monster in it? been done. Could be anything. The body of a creature from outer space? A troll? Have open spaces between the stairs, and it reaches through and drags people in by the feet, gobbles them up. He, he, he. Chicken. What's wrong with the way it really was? Yuck. Horror's supposed to be fun. But there's a real story there. Who is she? Who put the stake in her chest? Was the lock brand new, put on the hotel doors by the same person who hid her under the stairs. Best of all, what happens if you pull the stake? Lies there. Dead meat. But what if life flows into her? Her dry, crusty skin becomes smooth and youthful. Her flat breasts swell into gorgeous mounds. Her sunken face fills out. She is beautiful beyond your wildest imagination. She is breathtaking and blood-taking. She doesn't bite your neck after all. That's because she's grateful to you for freeing her to live again, feels so indebted that she'll do anything for you. You're her master, and she will do your bidding. In effect, you have this gorgeous thing as your slave. Real Possibilities 9. Lane shoved her books onto the locker shelf, took out her lunch bag, and shut the metal door. As she gave the combination lock a twirl, an arm slipped around her stomach, a mouth pressed the side of her neck. She cringed as chilled scurried up her skin. Stop it, she said, whirling around. Couldn't help myself, Jim said. Lane looked past him. The hallway was crowded. Kids were wandering by, talking and laughing. Those who weren't with friends all seemed to be in a great hurry. Lockers slammed. Teachers stood near their classroom doorways, on the lookout for trouble. Nobody seemed to be paying any attention to Lane and Jim. "'Did you miss me?' Jim asked. "'I survived. Uh-oh. Am I in trouble? I don't much care to be grabbed in public. How many times do I have to tell you that?' "'Oh, touchy. Are we on the rag?' Lane felt heat rush to her face. "'Real nice,' she muttered. "'Who died and made you king of the jerks?' He smiled, but there was no humor in his eyes. I was just kidding. Can't you take a joke? Obviously not. He dropped the smile. I don't need this. Good. Adios. Scowling, he muttered something Lane couldn't hear, turned away and joined the flow of the hallway crowd. He walked about twenty feet, then glanced over his shoulder as if he expected Lane to come rushing after him. She gave him a glare. He smirked as if to say, You're lost, bitch then continued down the hall. Creep, she thought. On the rag, what a shitty thing to say. She leaned back against her locker and took a deep breath, trying to calm herself. She felt hot with embarrassment and anger. Her heart thudded. She was trembling. Who needs him anyhow, she told herself. I was pretty rough on him, she thought, as she started down the hallway. It wasn't as if he did anything all that awful. Just kissed my neck, really. No big crime but he shouldn't have done it right in front of everyone. He knows how I feel about that kind of thing. Even if I did give him a hard time, it was no reason to make a crude remark like that. She had missed him. All weekend she'd looked forward to seeing him again. She suddenly felt cheated and sad. Her new outfit made it worse. 
like getting all dressed up for a party and being left at home. Why did he have to act like that? He can be such a jerk sometimes. Whenever he didn't get his way, Lane got to see his snotty side. Afterward, though, he was usually quick to apologize, and he could be so sweet that she found it difficult to hold on to her anger. She supposed the same thing would happen this time. One of these days, she told herself, he'll go too far and that'll be the end of it. Maybe he just did. But the thought of breaking up with Jim made her feel empty and alone. He was the only real boyfriend she'd had since starting at Buford High. Ever, for that matter. They'd shared so much. He might act like a creep sometimes, but nobody's perfect. You're just too chicken to dump him, she thought. In no time at all, everyone in school would know they had split up. When that happened, she would be fair game. She'd either have to become a hermit or risk going out with virtual strangers, and some of them were bound to be creeps. At least you know you can handle Jim. True love, she thought. I must be out of my gourd. You don't keep going with a guy forever just because he's okay and you're afraid you might do worse. When he tries to make up this time, I should just tell him to drop dead. On the rag. A. I'm not. B. Screw him anyway. In the cafeteria she spotted Jim at one of the long lunch tables, surrounded by his jock friends. Betty and Henry were at a corner table, sitting across from each other at its far end, several empty chairs between them and the rowdy clique of girls occupying the other end. After buying a Pepsi at the drinks-only window, she went to join them. "'Mind if I sit here?' she asked. "'Okay with me,' Henry said. "'Just don't embarrass us by sticking a straw up your nostril.' "'The hell with that. How will I drink my pop?' "'Take a load off,' Betty said. She pulled out the metal folding chair and sat down beside Henry. "'So how come you're not eating with Jim Dandy?' he asked. "'Did your taste buds finally rebel at the prospect?' "'Something like that. We had a little problem.' Betty, about to take a bite, frowned and set her sandwich down. "'Are you all right?' Lane realized she suddenly had a lump in her throat. She didn't trust herself to speak, so she nodded. "'The dirt bag,' Betty said. "'Want me to kick his butt?' Henry asked. "'You'd need the Seventh Cavalry,' Betty told him, "'and they already bought it at the Little Bighorn. "'Very funny.' "'I don't know why you put up with him,' she said. "'Her cheeks wobbled as she shook her head. "'Good Lord, girl, you know darn well "'you could have any guy in the school. "'Except for Henry, of course. "'I'd be forced to kill him if he made a play for you.' "'You ladies could share me,' he suggested. "'But I mean it, though. "'Seriously, Jim's always giving you grief about one thing or another. Why do you stand for it? I don't know. Because he's so cute, Henry said. Stick it in your ear. This is serious. Maybe I will dump him, Lane said. It's just getting worse all the time. Grinning, Henry leaned sideways and slipped an arm around her back. Saturday night, you and me, we'll make beautiful music together. Lane saw a quick look of alarm on Betty's face, then the girl narrowed her eyes and said, "'Prepare to meet your maker, Henrietta.' "'Sorry,' Lane told him. "'I'd hold myself responsible for your demise. I can't have that on my conscience. I'd die happy.' Betty's face went red. She pressed her lips together. "'That's enough, Henry,' Lane said. He tried to hang on to his silly grin, but it fell off. He pulled his arm in. "'Just kidding,' he said. Just kidding. That's what Jim had said. What was it, the standard excuse when a guy makes an ass of himself? Lane opened her bag and took out the sandwich. It was wrapped in cellophane. She saw egg salad bulging out between the bread. Just trying to make you jealous, sweet stuff, he said to Betty. You'd stand as much chance with Lane as an ice cube in a hot skillet. Tears suddenly burned Lane's eyes. She slapped her sandwich down hard on the table. I'm sorry, she blurted. God damn it, don't do this. You're my friends. They both gaped at her. I'm sorry, okay? Gee, Henry said. It's all right, Betty murmured. You okay? Lane shook her head. I know just the thing to make you feel better. What? Lane asked. Let me eat that sandwich for you. She gasped out a laugh. Not a chance. Grab it off her hen, and I'll forgive you. He reached for it. Lane caught his wrist and pinned it to the table. Try it again, she warned, and you'll be picking your nose left-handed. 
He's such a klutz he'd put out his eye. Lane let go. When she finished unwrapping her sandwich, she tore it down the middle and offered half to Betty. The girl leered at it but shook her head. Go on, Lane told her. I don't have much of an appetite anyway. If you're sure. She took it. They ate their lunches and chatted, and everything seemed normal again. But Lane knew that damage had been done. Obviously, Betty had seen through Henry's joking around, realized he would dump her in an eye blink if he thought he stood a chance with Lane. Break up with Jim, and sooner or later Henry probably will ask you out. Then you'll be minus your two best friends. Jessica's assigned seat in Mr. Kramer's sixth period English class was at the front of the room, just to the left of Lane's desk. Today, Riley Benson swaggered down the aisle and sat there. He slumped against the back rest, stretched out his legs, and crossed his motorcycle boots. He looked at Lane. His face, with half-shut, sullen eyes, never failed to remind her of television news photos that showed men who put bullets into people for the fun of it. Twisting around, she saw Jessica in Riley's usual seat at the rear corner. We traded, he said. You got a problem? None of my business. She turned to the front. The final bell hadn't clamored yet, and Mr. Kramer rarely entered the classroom before the bell. She hoped he would show up soon. Riley had a reputation for starting trouble, and she was pretty sure that she'd already been chosen as today's target. Thanks a heap, Jessica. The trade had to be Jessica's idea. Lane could understand that. Battered the way she was, the girl probably wanted to be as inconspicuous as possible. It crossed her mind that Riley might be the guy who'd beaten up Jessica. She knew they'd been going together, and he sure seemed capable of such things. Maybe Jessica gave him some lip. She could have made up the mugging story. Lane looked over at him. His fingers were wrapping out a rhythm on the edge of the desk. He had dirty knuckles, but they weren't bruised or scraped. He might have been wearing gloves, though, or done the damage with a blunt instrument of some kind. "'You got a problem?' he asked. No. Uh-uh. She turned her eyes to the front. Bitch. This is really my day. She stared at Mr. Kramer's empty desk. Her back felt rigid, her heart was thumping hard, and her face was hot. Come on, teacher. Where are you? Fucking twat. Her head snapped toward him. Blow it out your ass, Benson. The bell blared and she flinched. Riley's lip curled up. See you after class. Count on it. Oh, I'm so scared. I'm trembling. You ought to be. In fact, she was. Now I've done it, she thought. Why didn't I keep my mouth shut? It was little consolation when Mr. Kramer entered the room. If only he'd shown up a couple of minutes ago. Roll book in hand, he settled down against the front edge of his desk and fixed his eyes on Riley. I believe you're in the wrong seat, Mr. Benson. You got a problem with that? As a matter of fact, yes, I do. Lane felt a grin spreading across her face. Give it to him, Kramer. Please return to your assigned seat, now. From the back of the room came Jessica's voice. I asked Riley to trade with me, she said. Never the... For an instant he looked surprised, then concern furrowed his brow. My God, what happened to you? I got racked up, okay. Can I just stay here? Did somebody do that to you? No, I fell down the stairs. Maybe she had a different story for everyone. I'm very sorry to hear that, Jessica, but I'm afraid I'll have to insist that you both resume your proper seats. Riley mumbled something, gathered his books, and headed for the back of the classroom. Good show, Lane thought. No wonder Kramer was one of the most popular teachers at Buford High. Not only young, handsome, and clever, but he had the guts to keep discipline. Plenty of other teachers would have backed off and let Riley stay. Lane suddenly remembered Riley's threat. She felt herself go hot and shaky again. Jessica slid into her seat. She sat up straight, facing Kramer. Thanks a lot, teach, she muttered. You're not outside now. Take off those sunglasses. That's going a little too far, Lane thought. Jessica dropped her sunglasses onto the desktop. Lane could only see her right eye. It was swollen nearly shut. Her upper lid, shiny and purple, bulged as if someone had jammed a half a golf ball underneath it. Kramer pursed his lips. He shook his head. You may put the glasses back on, he said. 
Thanks, Ahib. Okay, we've wasted enough time. Take out your texts and turn to page 58. Lane watched the clock. This was the last class of the day. It had forty-five minutes to go. He won't try anything, she told herself. He wouldn't dare. I'll be okay if I can just get to my car. Thirty minutes to go. Ten. In spite of the air conditioning, Lane was bathed with sweat. Her T-shirt felt sodden against her armpits. Cool dribbles trickled down between her breasts. Her panties were glued to her rump. With one minute to go, she piled her books on top of her binder, ready to bolt for the door. The bell rang. She pressed the books to her chest, slid out of the seat, and stood up. Kramer met her eyes. Miss Dunbar, I'd like to speak with you for a minute. No. Yes, sir, she said. She sank back onto her seat and put the books down. Why was he doing this to her? Was he annoyed because she'd seemed in such a rush to get out? I'm doomed, she thought. Mr. Kramer stepped behind his desk and stuffed books into his briefcase. The kids hurried out. The room had doors at the front and rear. Riley didn't leave by the front. He'd probably use the other door, but Lane forced herself not to look. Maybe he forgot about me. Fat chance. Mr. Kramer came around his desk and sat on its edge, facing her. He held some typed sheets in his hand. He wants to discuss one of my themes? But Lane could see that it wasn't hers. It looked like erasable paper. The stuff always felt sticky, and the ink had a tendency to smear if you rubbed it, but she'd used it anyway until her father had told her to throw away that junk and use some decent bond. He'd gone on to say that only amateurs fooled with erasable paper, and editors hated it with a passion. That isn't mine, she said. Mr. Kramer smiled. I'm aware of that. What I have here is a book report that I found very interesting. It was written by Henry Piedmont. Is he a friend of yours? Yes. Henry, she knew, had Kramer for second period. He's quite a good student, but he does have a peculiar taste in literature. He seems to relish the macabre. Yeah, I've noticed. Kramer fluttered the pages a bit. This particular report deals with a book called Night Watcher by Lawrence Dunbar. He tipped his head sideways and smiled at Lane. So that's it, she thought. I'm not in trouble after all. Just in trouble with Riley. He's my dad, she admitted, feeling a mix of pride and embarrassment. Henry mentions that in his report. Thanks, Hen. We don't have many real authors living here in Mulehead Bend. In fact, your father is the only one I'm aware of. Do you suppose he might be willing to come in some time and talk to the class? He might. He's kind of busy, but... I'm sure he is. We wouldn't want to impose on him, but I think that the class might enjoy hearing what he has to say. I've never read any of his books myself. They're not exactly my cup of tea. A lot of people feel that way, Lane said. I've seen his books on the stands, though, and I've seen any number of students with them. They need more parental supervision. Kramer laughed softly. He may be a teacher, Lane thought, but he's sure a neat guy. I understand that the novels are pretty nasty. You were misinformed. They're extremely nasty. I'm under strict orders not to read any until I'm thirty-five. I'll bet you've disobeyed, though, haven't you? Lane grinned. I've read them all. Under the bed covers, I presume. Some of the time. Well, I'd really appreciate it if you would talk to him. If you could find the time to come in, I think the kids would get quite a charge out of it. He might want to tell them about how he became a writer, why he chose to specialize in extremely nasty novels, that kind of thing. I'll check with him about it. Fine. I won't keep you any longer now. But let me know, okay? Sure. She picked up her books. As she scooted off the seat, she saw him glance at her legs and look away quickly. At least somebody appreciates the dress, she thought. Too bad he has to be a teacher. Heading toward the door, she was hit again by the knowledge that Riley might be waiting for her. What if I ask Mr. Kramer to walk me out to the parking lot? No way, she told herself, he might get the wrong idea. Unless I explain about Riley, and that might get Riley in hot water, and then I'd really be in trouble. See you tomorrow, she called over her shoulder. Have a nice evening, Lane. She stepped into the hallway. Leaning against the lockers on the other side was Jim. He lifted a hand in greeting. 
I wouldn't blame you if you told me to get lost, he said, coming toward her. I don't know what got into me this morning. I'm really sorry. You should be. You can wash my mouth out with soap, if that'd help any. That's an idea. She took hold of his hand. Next time, I just might. Am I forgiven, then? I guess so, this time. Together they walked down the hall. So much for dumping him, she thought. Guess I wasn't ready for it after all. Though she was a little disappointed in herself, she mostly felt relieved. I was afraid I'd really blown it, Jim said. All day I kept thinking about it and how much I'd miss you. I really love you, Lane. I don't know what I would have done if... Well, anyway, we're okay again, right? Yeah, we're okay. He squeezed her hand. In the parking lot, Lane spotted Riley Benson sitting on the hood of her Mustang. They were still some distance away, and Jim hadn't noticed him yet. But Riley saw them, scurried down, and swaggered off. 10. She was water-skiing on the river at night. She didn't want to be there. She was frightened. She wanted to stop, but didn't dare. The thing in the water would get her before the boat had time to swing around and pick her up. She didn't know what it was in the water, but something, something awful. The boat sped faster and faster, as if it wanted to help her escape. She skimmed over the smooth black surface, clinging to the handle of the tow line, whimpering with terror. Somehow she knew that the boat wasn't quick enough. The thing in the water was gaining on her. If they were closer to shore, if the boat took her near enough to a dock, she might let go of the line and her speed might take her gliding to safety. But she couldn't see the shore. On both sides there was only darkness. That's impossible, she thought. The river's no more than a quarter mile wide. Where are we? Sick with dread, she thought. We're not on the Colorado any more. Clutching the wooden handle with her right hand, she raised her left and waved for the boat to head ashore, wherever that might be. It kept its straight course. Look at me, her mind shrieked. Damn it, pay attention. She suddenly realized that she didn't know who was steering the boat. Then she saw that it was drawing away from her, as if the tow line were stretching. Slowly, the running lights faded with distance until they vanished entirely. Even the sound of the outboards died away. There was silence, except for the hiss of her skis. The tow rope led into darkness. She was alone, except for the thing under the river. Oh, God, what am I going to— Cold hands grabbed her ankles, tugged her straight down. She was still on her skis, still speeding at the end of the tow line, but under the surface. The water pushed at her. It filled her open mouth, muffling her scream as the hand scurried up her legs. She felt the thing's icy flesh against her back. It was standing on the skis behind her, riding them, reaching around her front, grabbing her hands, trying to rip them from the wooden bar. She held on with all her might. If I let go, he'll have me. He snapped her left arm, broke it off at the elbow. Her hand still clutched the bar for a moment, trailing its severed forearm. Then the rushing current took them away. A hand clamped over her mouth. It pinched her nostrils shut. She fought to suck in air. Somehow she'd been able to breathe in spite of the water gushing down her throat, but the hand was different. It was solid. Her lungs burned. She grabbed the hand and woke up, and the hand was still there, mashing her bruised mouth, pinching her nostrils shut. Don't make a sound, Jessica. Frantic for a breath, she nodded. The hand lifted. She sucked air into her starved lungs. Had a little nightmare, he whispered. He was on the bed, sitting on her, leaning forward and holding her by the shoulders. Jessica was no longer covered by her sheet. In the glow of moonlight from the windows, she saw that Kramer was shirtless. From the hot feel of his skin where he sat on her, she knew that he'd removed all his clothes before climbing onto her. He had slipped her nightshirt up, too. Her left forearm rested against her chest, its cast heavy and cool. You bastard! Shh! If you wake up your parents, I'll have to kill them. And you. I'll have to kill everyone. You wouldn't want that to happen, would you? No, she whispered. I didn't imagine you would. What do you want? she asked. The stupid question of the year. What he wanted was obvious, but she'd thought it was over. Saturday night she'd told him it was over, told him that he could find another girl, threatened to get him fired if he didn't stop. That had been the stupid threat of the year, but after finishing his little lesson he'd said, I'm sick of you anyway, you disgusting slut. I've been thinking, he whispered. I've been worrying. I'm not going to tell. How do I know that? Don't hurt me, 
Please. I didn't come here to hurt you, Jessica. I'm here for only one reason. Well, maybe two. He laughed softly. She squirmed as a hand slid down from her shoulder and squeezed her breast. I'm here to teach you a lesson. A lesson about safety. For you, there is no safety. Do you understand? She nodded. If you should ever happen to tell someone about me, I'll come into your home just as I did tonight. There will be one difference. I'll have a straight razor in my hand. I'll begin by slashing the throats of your parents while they sleep, and then I'll come to you. A fingernail circled her nipple. I'll cut you very badly, everywhere. It may take all night. And just before dawn, I'll open your throat from ear to ear. Do you understand? Yes. Very good. The pale blur of his face drifted down. He kissed her sore lips. Very good, he whispered again. Eleven. Except for the struggle on Monday morning to come up with a new story, Larry had spent the entire week on Night Stranger. That book was coming along fine, but what about the next? He didn't feel like racking his mind for a new idea. So much easier to stick with the familiar territory of Night Stranger. He knew where that book was going and enjoyed the excitement of guiding it there. This was Friday. He couldn't keep avoiding the problem forever. Think how much better you'll feel, he told himself, once you've come up with a great plan for the next book. A great plan that does not include a stiff under the stairs with a stake in its heart. He found the disk from Monday, put it into his word processor, and tapped out commands until Novel Notes, Monday, October 3rd, appeared at the corner of the screen. As he cleaned a pipe and loaded it with fresh tobacco, he skimmed the amber lines. About three pages worth of material. And nothing. A lot of crap about their vampire. In effect, he read, you have this gorgeous thing as your slave. Real possibilities. Sure. Better luck today. Larry lit his pipe. Below real possibilities, he typed, notes, Friday, October 7th. How about a tribe of desert scavengers, he wrote, recalling the idea he'd toyed around with shortly before the van reached Sagebrush Flat. They arrange accidents on the back roads, then fall upon the unlucky travelers. Too much like the hills have eyes. Besides, I already did something along those lines in savage timber. Larry scowled at the screen. He wished he hadn't reminded himself of savage timber. That damn novel, his second, had nearly destroyed his career. A major release, and all it did was sit in the stores, thanks to that damn green foil artsy fart cover. Don't think about it, he told himself. Come on, a new idea. How about a guy who finds the remains of an old jukebox, he restores it to working order, and... And what? It doesn't have any records in it. He puts in his own, but it doesn't play the new ones. All it will play are the oldies but goodies that used to be in it, back before it was shot to pieces by... Hey, maybe it wants revenge on the vandals who used it for target practice. Great, a pissed-off jukebox. What does it do, scoot around and electrocute people? Could be like a time machine. The guy gets it working, and it shoves him into the past. So he finds himself stranded in Holman's, or a dive of some kind, back in the mid-sixties. Has possibilities. Maybe the box wants him there to have a showdown with the jerks who plugged it. A motorcycle gang or something. A real nasty bunch. The poor guy doesn't know what's in store for him but he's plenty upset. It's Twilight Zone time. One minute he's with his wife and kids, has a nice house and a good job. Suddenly, bam, he finds himself in a diner in a dying town twenty-five years in the past. Freaks him out. All he wants to do is get home. Until he finds himself falling for a beautiful young waitress. At that point, he begins to appreciate his situation. Things start to get ugly when a gang of biker thugs thunders into town. Suppose the real reason the jukebox took him there was to save the waitress. Neat. The jukebox likes her. Sometimes, alone at night after the diner closes, she has it play her favorite tunes and she dances alone in the dark. The way things went down, first time around, the bikers raped and murdered her. The jukebox has brought our hero back to the diner to alter the course of history, to save her. Which, of course, he does. Mission accomplished, the box lets him go home again. But he misses the beautiful waitress. 
Okay, he didn't have a wonderful wife and kids. He was divorced or something. He goes looking for the gal, finds her. She's his mother. He's his own father. He got her pregnant during their brief time together back in 65, and he was the baby she had. He'd have to be about 30 years old in the present. She could be about 25 when he met her in the diner. She had to give up the baby, our hero, for some reason. He was adopted and always curious about the identity of his parents. If she is his mother, we could give him back his wife and kids. Neither, if he finds the waitress in the present and they resume as lovers. But how would that work with their ages? Say he's thirty in the present. How could the gal be anywhere near his age when he finds her again? If she's thirty now, she would have been five when he saved her from the bikers. What if the waitress he fell in love with was her mother? That would make the daughter just his age in the present, and she is the spitting image of her mother, the gal he loved. Not bad. Might work. Larry's pipe had gone out. He could tell by the easy draw that nothing remained in the bowl but ash. He set the pipe into its holder and returned his fingers to the keyboard. Our main guy resurrects the jukebox. It seems evil at first, but turns out to be a force for good, and a matchmaker. He falls for the waitress, who happens to have a real cute little girl at the time. Plenty of thrills and spills and nasty crap with the bikers make them total degenerates, monsters. By facing them down, he's scared, but comes through, proving to himself that he's a man. He ends up saving the kid who will later become his true love. Why not? Larry grinned at the screen. All right, you've got it. Spend the next couple of days working out the details, and— the next couple of days. He muttered a curse. The weekend was shot. As soon as Lane got home from school today, they would be hitting the road for Los Angeles to visit with Gene's folks. Just what he wanted to do. Especially now, with the new idea sizzling in his mind. Can't get out of it, though. You'll just have to put the idea on hold till Monday. It would give him something to think about while he drove. He might be able to work out a few of the main scenes, maybe even come up with some nifty new angles. But he knew very well that daydreaming about the story, while he steered down the freeway, would accomplish very little compared to working at the word processor. The act of typing out his thoughts seemed to give them a focus that wasn't there when he simply let his mind wander. Daydreams seemed to meander and drift. But sentences were solid, and one led to another. Not this weekend, they won't. This weekend's down the toilet. Well, he tried to console himself. Jean's folks are okay. And it is their anniversary. I'll probably end up having a good time, even though I'd rather be... He heard the doorbell ring. Jean would take care of it. He wondered whether he should get back to Night Stranger or spend the rest of the day fleshing out his jukebox story. Call it The Box, he suddenly thought, and grinned. The Box, he typed. Great title, has a mysterious ring to it, and box not only refers to the jukebox that sends him back in time, but also the box or trap he finds himself stuck in. He's boxed in by circumstances, no apparent way out. Also the sex thing, have one of the bikers refer to the main gal as a box, foxy box. And maybe the main guy is a former boxer, killed an opponent in the ring, and swore off fighting? No, that'd be pushing it. Trite, too. But maybe there are some other box angles. Fool around with it. He heard Jean's footsteps approaching. She might come in and look over his shoulder, so he scrolled down until Foxy Box climbed out of sight at the top of the screen. She rapped on the office door and pushed it open. In her hand was an overnight mail bag that looked large enough to hold a manuscript. This just came for you, she said. It's from Chandler House. His publisher. Gene watched while he tore open the bag. Inside he found a fat manuscript held together by rubber bands, and a typewritten note from his editor, Susan Anderson. Larry, here is the copy-edited manuscript of Madhouse. The corrections are light, so I'm sure you'll be pleased. We would like you to make whatever changes you consider appropriate, and return it to us, if possible, by October 13th. Best. Susan. Larry grimaced. What? Jean asked. It's Madhouse, the copy-edited version. I'm supposed to send it back by the 13th. He glanced at his calendar. Christ, that's next Thursday. They didn't give you much time. 
That's for sure, he muttered. They've had it for about a year and a half, and now I get six days. Have fun, Jean said. She left the room, closing the door again to keep his pipe smoke from contaminating the rest of the house. Larry pushed his chair back, crossed a leg, rested the thick manuscript on his thigh, and rolled the rubber bands off. He tossed Susan's note and the title page onto the cluttered TV tray beside his chair. Then he groaned. For light corrections, page one seemed to have an awful lot of changes. Halfway down the page, his paragraph used to read, She tugged at the door. Locked. God, no. She whirled around and choked out a whimper. He was already off the autopsy table, staggering toward her, his head bobbing and swaying on its broken neck. In his hand was the scalpel. Larry struggled to decipher the changes. Words had been crossed out, others added. The paragraph was a map of lines and arrows. At last he figured it out. Tugging at the door, she found it to be locked. No. Snapping her head around, she whimpered in despair, for she saw that the corpse was staggering toward her with a scalpel in his hand. His head was swinging from side to side atop its snapped neck. Jesus H. Christ on a crutch, Larry muttered. He found Jean in their bedroom, gathering clothes from an open drawer of her bureau and taking them to her suitcase. Both suitcases lay open on the bed. He sat down at the end of the mattress. We've got a problem. The manuscript? I just looked through the whole thing. It's been wrecked. Not again. Yeah. Madhouse was his twelfth novel and the third to be demolished by a copy editor. What are you going to do? Jean asked. I have to fix it. I don't have any choice. He scowled at the carpet. Maybe I could get them to take my name off and publish it under the name of the copy editor. It's that bad? And then some. Why do they let it happen? God, I don't know. It's the luck of the draw, I guess. This time they happen to send my book to some idiot who thinks she's a writer. Or he, Jean said, standing up for her gender. Or it. Couldn't you just write a letter to Susan or something and explain the situation? Maybe they could send a fresh copy to someone else. He shook his head. I don't think she'd appreciate that. It'd be like calling them jerks for sending it to some illiterate butcher. Besides, they already paid to have it done, and they're on a tight time schedule by now, or they wouldn't want the damn thing back in six days. Maybe you should phone Susan. The last thing I need is to get a reputation as a troublemaker. So you're just going to take it lying down? I'm going to take it sitting on my butt with a red pen in one hand and a copy of my British edition in the other. If the people in London didn't fix it, it didn't need fixing. He hung his head and sighed. Jean stepped in front of him. She rubbed his shoulders. I'm sorry, honey. Fortunes of war. The thing is, it'll have to be mailed Wednesday for next day delivery. If I go to your folks' place... That only gives me about three days to go through the whole damn thing and try to save it. You could take it along. I wouldn't be fit to live with anyway. Maybe you and Lane should just go ahead without me. As he spoke the words, he realized that he didn't want to be left behind. Not for this. But he couldn't go. If I spend the whole weekend working on it, maybe I'll be feeling human again by the time you get back. I suppose we could call it off, she said, stroking his hair. Go up next weekend instead. No, don't do that. It's their anniversary. Besides, you've been looking forward to it. No need for all of us to suffer because of this crap. If you're sure, she muttered, I don't see any choice. Larry went back to his office. His throat felt tight. You didn't want to go in the first place, he reminded himself but that was before he found out he would have to be laboring over Madhouse. He stared at his computer screen. Maybe there are some other box angles. Fool around with it. Right, sure thing. Maybe sometime next week. No more working out the details for the box. No more plunging toward the conclusion of Night Stranger. The next few days belonged to Madhouse, a book that he'd finished eighteen months ago, a book that had already been published in England, and about all they had changed over there was windshield to windscreen, and added use to words like color. So who said life is fair, he muttered, and shut his computer off. Twelve. I have a special announcement to make, Mr. Kramer said with two minutes remaining before the bell. 
As I've mentioned before, the drama department at the City College is putting on Hamlet next week. I'm sure the production will be well worth seeing for all of you, and I urge every one of you to attend if you can. Now here's the thing. I've obtained four free tickets to the Saturday night performance. Only four of you will be able to participate, but for those lucky students, I'll provide tickets and transportation. He smiled. That way you won't have to bug your parents to borrow a car. A few of the kids laughed. If any of you would like to take advantage of the opportunity, just stay in your seats after the bell rings. Lane gnawed her lower lip. Should she stay? Jim might ask her out for that night. We can always go out Friday night instead, she told herself. It would be neat to see the play, especially with Mr. Kramer. Couldn't hurt either, in the brownie points department. The bell rang. Lane remained in her seat. As Jessica stepped by, she glanced at Lane and shook her head. Probably thinks I'm an idiot wanting to give up a Saturday night to see Shakespeare. Maybe I am. If it turns out that Jim's busy Friday night, I'm going to kick myself. He was gone last weekend. I'll be gone this weekend. That'll make three weeks in a row if I go to the play and he can't make it on Friday. This Saturday night was when she'd wanted to go out with him. All week he'd been especially nice, trying to make up, Lane supposed, for being such a creep Monday morning. She turned on her seat. Five other kids had remained in the room. There's six of us, and he can only take four. If I'm not picked, that'll solve the problem right there. I see you've got more Shakespeare fans than tickets, Mr. Kramer said. That's certainly gratifying, but it does present a little difficulty. We want to be fair about this. He dug a hand into a pocket of his slacks and pulled out a quarter. I'll flip a coin. The first two of you to lose will have to bow out. Does that sound okay to everyone? Nobody objected. Okay, Lane, you first. Call it in the air. He rested the coin on his thumbnail and flicked it high. Heads, Lane said. It landed in the palm of his right hand. He slapped it onto the back of his left, kept it covered, and smiled at her. Want to change your mind? Nope. I'll stick with heads. He looked. Heads it is, he said, tipping his hand and letting the coin drop into the other. He didn't let anyone see it, Lane realized. What the heck? They're his tickets. Okay, George, your turn. George won. So did Aaron and Sandra. Jerry and Heidi, the losers, called the coin again to determine who would be the first choice as an alternate in case one of the chosen was unable to attend. Heidi won. Okay, Mr. Kramer said. I'll fill you in on the details later. In the meantime, have a good weekend. Don't do anything I wouldn't. That comment brought a few chuckles. Lane gathered her books and stood up. I'm glad you're one of the lucky four, he said. Maybe I'll get a chance to meet your father when I pick you up for the play. I'm sure he'll be glad to meet you. I'll have to pick up one of his books and get an autograph. That'll make his day. And maybe we can firm up the date he'll be coming in. Yeah he said, any time after the first. Well, maybe we can make it more definite. Lane nodded. Have a nice weekend, Mr. Kramer. You too. Try to stay out of trouble. He winked. What would be the fun of that? She said, blushing. As he laughed, Lane waved goodbye and left the room. The hallway was crowded with kids, noisy with slamming lockers, shouts and laughter. She leaned against a wall and waited for Jim. A few minutes later, he came along. I have to drop some stuff off at my locker, Lane said. They started up the hall together. When are you leaving for Los Angeles? he asked. As soon as I get home. What a drag. There's always next weekend. Next Friday, anyway. I have to go to a place Saturday night with Mr. Kramer. Yeah? He glanced at her, lifting an eyebrow. Isn't he a little old for you? Get real. It's a school function. He's taking four of us from his sixth period class. Great. Oh, now, don't start pouting. I've got nothing on Friday night. Nothing on, huh? I'd like to see that. I just bet you would. She felt a hand slide over the seat of her skirt. Quit it. Sorry, just trying to refresh my memory. It's been two whole weeks, you know, and now it'll be another. I'm not overjoyed about it myself. Nothing I can do, though. She arrived at her locker and started spinning the combination dial. Maybe you could pretend to be sick, he suggested. What if you did that, and they let you stay home by yourself? I could come over to your house tomorrow night and dream on, Macduff. She opened the locker and switched books, taking out those she would need for homework. Then she shut the metal door. 
Even if I did stay home, boys aren't allowed in the house when my parents are gone. Who would ever know? I would. Anyway, you might as well forget it. Ain't gonna happen. They started down the hallway. If you promise to behave, Lane said, I'll give you a ride home. What about your goofball friends, fat and ugly? Lane frowned at him. I don't know who you mean. You know all right, Betty and Henry. Why don't you refer to them that way, okay? They are my friends. God knows why. Are you trying to start something? No, no, just kidding. They're wonderful people, the salt of the earth. You could stand to be a little more like Henry. Uh, duh. He put a dopey smile on his face and started bobbing his head. Very funny, she said, but couldn't hold back a smile. Stop it. That's not nice. Duh, okay. Anyway, Betty's mom was picking them up after school and taking them to violin lessons. So it'll just be you and me, huh? If you can fit your big head into the car. I can try. At the end of the hallway, Jim held the door open for her. She stepped out and looked toward the student parking lot. She spotted her red Mustang. No sign of Riley Benson. After Monday, she'd expected each afternoon to find him perched on the hood. So far, he hadn't tried it again. Though they crossed paths several times a day, he'd done no more than give her tough-guy looks. He must have given up on his big plan for revenge, she decided. Maybe Jessica had talked him out of it. Pays to be nice to people, she thought, especially if they're buddy-buddy with someone who wants to wipe up the floor with you. When Lane opened the car door, hot air poured out. They cranked down all the windows. She took a beach towel from the trunk and spread it over the driver's seat so she wouldn't burn her legs on the upholstery. You don't have one for me? Jim asked. You're not wearing a skirt. You sure are, he said, and bent forward as if trying for a glimpse of her panties when she climbed in. Pink, he announced. Wrong. She started the engine. She twisted around to look out the rear window as she backed out of the space. She could feel her blouse pulled tight against her breasts. Jim, of course, was staring at them. If they match your bra, they're white, he said. Don't you ever think about anything but sex, she asked, grinning at him. Sure. Instead, sometimes I think about sex. She shook her head, faced forward again, and steered for the parking lot exit. Must be hot wearing a bra all the time. What makes you think I wear one all the time? Every time I've seen you. Are you sure? Are you kidding? I can tell a mile away if a babe's got one on. That's impressive. How long is your car going to be out of commission? Lane asked, hoping to change the subject. I'll have it off the blocks tomorrow. I wanted it ready so we could go out tomorrow night. Sorry about that. Maybe I'll give Candy a call. I know, just kidding. Jim said nothing. Lane got a tight, sickish feeling deep inside. She kept her eyes on the road. You wouldn't mind, would you? Be my guest. She knew that Jim was teasing. He had no intention of taking out Candy. He dumped Candy in order to start going out with her. The threat of taking up with Candy again was nothing more than a form of punishment. You know what they say about a bird in the hand, Jim said. A good way to get a dirty hand. Also, she's a lot more cooperative than some people I might mention. And probably has the diseases to prove it. Oh, mean. But feel free to take her out. It's your life. He reached over and put a hand on Lane's leg. You know I wouldn't do that. I only know what you tell me. I miss you, that's all. I miss you, too. But there's nothing I can do about this weekend. Yeah, I know. He squeezed her knee, and his hand moved slowly up her bare leg to the hem of her skirt. He caressed her thigh. It felt good. Just don't go throwing candy at me every time you get upset. Jealous? Suppose I was always threatening to dump you for Cliff Riker. That shithead. You think you'd enjoy it? You wouldn't. Not if you went ahead with it. He's cute. Not as cute as me. Jim's hand crept under her skirt. She pushed it away. He's no gentleman, either. And you are? I'm not like Cliff. He isn't the kind of guy who takes no for an answer. First time out with him, and he'd bang you till you couldn't see straight. If that's what you want, I'll be glad to take care of it for you. You go out with Candy, and you'll never get the chance. Hmm, I like the sound of that. You mean if I don't? I do. Where there's life, there's hope. 
she pulled the Mustang over to the curb in front of Jim's house. Checking the windows and rearview mirror, she saw nobody nearby. She turned to Jim. She slipped a hand around the back of his neck. No funny stuff, she said. Just a quick kiss. How about coming in for a Pepsi or something? She shook her head. I have to get home. My folks are waiting. Ten minutes? That won't throw off your trip by much. Tell them you had to stay after class. I did have to stay after class, she thought. It wouldn't be a lie. Is your mother home? Jim answered by swinging a thumb over his shoulder, pointing out the Mazda in the driveway. Okay, Lane said. Ten minutes. No longer, though. She took her hand away from his neck and climbed out. Jim stayed in the lead as she walked up the flagstones to the front stoop. He unlocked the door and held it open for her. The air was cool. The house was silent except for the hum of the air conditioning system. Jim didn't call out to announce that he was home. Are you sure she's here? Lane asked. Might be sleeping or taking a bath. Who knows? They entered the kitchen. Lane leaned against a counter while Jim took a couple of cans from the refrigerator. The air smelled fresh. It was almost too cold on her skin. It chilled the damp back of her blouse. Jim found glasses, dropped ice cubes into them, and filled them with soda. A glass in each hand, he stepped in front of Lane. She reached for her drink. Instead of giving it to her, he stretched both arms past her sides and set the glasses on the counter. His arms closed around her, pulled her gently forward until their bodies met. What if your mother walks in? Lane whispered close to his mouth. I don't think she will. He tugged the tail of her blouse out of her skirt and slid his hands underneath. Lane let herself sink against him. She kissed him. Shouldn't be doing this, she thought. But she'd intended to kiss him goodbye anyway, and his hands felt good roaming the bare skin of her back. And she liked the feel of his chest tight against her breasts. She could feel his breathing and his heartbeat. He started to fumble with the catches of her bra. She pulled her mouth away. Oh, no, you don't. It's all right. No, it isn't. He unfastened the bra anyway. She felt it go loose. She grabbed Jim's arms and pushed them down to his sides. I said no, and I meant it. Come on, what's the harm? For one thing, your mother. She might be in town at the beauty parlor, he said, smiling as if he expected Lane to appreciate the news. The car. She usually goes with Mary from next door, right about three on Fridays. You knew she wasn't here? Still smiling, Jim shrugged. You lied to me. Just a little fib. Terrific, she muttered, reaching up under the back of her blouse to fasten the bra. Come on, don't do that. He lifted his hands to her breasts. Cut it out. Come on, you like it. I told you. She got one of the hooks fastened. He was squeezing, rubbing. She did like it. Damn it, Jim. Not bothering with the other hook, she swung her hands around and pushed him away. I have to leave. No, you don't. Hey, come on. This is what I get for trusting you, huh? Look, I'm sorry I lied about Mom being here, okay? He looked into her eyes and gently held her shoulders. I just figured you wouldn't come in, and we haven't been together for weeks. I get crazy wanting to be with you. Sometimes all I can think about is kissing you and how it feels to hold you, especially after last time. That was nice, Lane said, remembering. She had been under orders to be home by eleven, so they'd skipped the second feature at the movies and parked in the desert outside town. She'd refused Jim's suggestion to get into the back seat. Staying in the front, they twisted themselves awkwardly to embrace and kiss. But it was wonderful. She felt daring and romantic and sexy in the moonlit car. Her blouse came off early. She managed to keep her bra on, though, in spite of Jim's begging and his attempts to remove it. In spite of her own desire to rid herself of the garment and feel his touch without a stiff layer of cloth in the way, finally she'd told him, it's almost time to leave. He didn't protest, simply nodded and murmured, I guess so. Reaching behind her back, Lane unhooked her bra. She took it off. His mouth fell open, and he stared for a long time before touching. When he did touch her breasts, his hands were trembling. Softened by the memories of that night, she stepped forward and put her arms around Jim. She kissed him gently on the mouth. Apology accepted, she whispered. But I really do have to leave now. His hand slid down her back and caressed her rump. 
What about your Pepsi? Time's all up. You can walk me to the car, though. He squeezed her against him and kissed her hard, then stepped away. Guess I'll just have to wait for next Friday, huh? It'll get here. Not soon enough. I'll miss you, she said. I'll miss you more. No, you won't. Yes, I will. Want to fight about it? Yeah, he said. Let's wrestle. Oh, you'd like that. So would you. Maybe. Holding hands, they walked to the door. Thirteen. Larry stood at the end of the driveway, waving goodbye to Jean and Lane as the car headed off down the road. It seemed strange being left behind. He knew he would miss them. Hell, he already missed them. On the other hand, he rather liked the prospect of being on his own for the weekend. He could do whatever he pleased and not have to answer to anyone. Freedom. He felt like a kid being left home without parents or babysitter. The car vanished around the corner. Larry turned toward the house, then raised a hand in greeting as Barbara trotted down the steps next door. A handbag swung at her hip. Larry supposed she was leaving on an errand. So they took off without you. Sure did. Jean told me about that manuscript. She stopped beside her car in the driveway. Sounds like the pits to me. Gives me a good excuse to stay behind, he said, smiling. If you're not too busy, why don't you come over for dinner? We'll throw some steaks on the barbecue. Sounds great. Good. Drop in around five, then. All right? I'll be there. She climbed into her car, and Larry headed for the house. Things are perking up already, he thought. In his office, he glanced at the savaged manuscript and realized he was in no mood to struggle with it. He'd already fought his way through more than a hundred pages today, scratching out the copy editor's misguided corrections and replacing them with scribbles to match the printed lines as they'd originally been written. That was plenty for one day's work. He settled down in the living room with the beer and the Sean Hudson novel he'd started reading that morning. Though his eyes traveled over the words, his mind kept slipping out of the story. He found himself imagining what Jean's folks might say when they realized he'd stayed home, wondering what he should wear over to Pete and Barbara's, thinking about how much he would like to spend all day tomorrow working on ideas for the box. Then he was speculating about the jukebox in the ditch. He wondered how much it weighed. Could two men lift it? In his book, they would have to carry it to the van. Would that be possible? Have the women lend a hand with it? My main guy isn't married. Might have a girlfriend with him, though. Still occupied with his thoughts, Larry set the book aside. He drained the last of his beer, wandered into the bedroom, and took off his clothes. Have one of the gals fall while they're lugging the jukebox up the slope. Good. Foreshadowing that the box is going to cause trouble. In the bathroom, he turned on the shower and stepped under its beating spray. She tumbles down the embankment, he thought as he began to soap himself. Gets banged up pretty much like Barbara did in the hotel. He remembered the way Barbara had looked, standing in the doorway afterward, how her legs and belly were scraped, how her blouse hung open. The images stirred a pleasant heat in his groin, which turned cold when he suddenly saw himself kneeling under the staircase, gazing at the shriveled corpse. God, he wished he'd never seen that thing. It always seemed to be with him, waiting, like some kind of spook lurking in a dark closet of his mind, every now and then throwing open the door to give him another look. So damn grisly and repulsive, but fascinating, too. As Larry washed his hair, his mind ran through the familiar questions. Who was she? Who drove the stake into her chest? Was her presence under the stairway known to the person who put the brand new lock on the hotel doors? Could she really be a vampire? What might happen if someone pulled out the stake? He had no answers. He told himself, as always, that he didn't want to know the answers. He only wanted to forget about the thing. Which wasn't about to happen. Maybe we should have reported it, he thought. He'd been against that at the time. Now, however, he saw how it might have been for the best. A call to the cops would have relieved them of responsibility, like passing the baton. We did our part. Now it's your turn. Part of the problem, he realized, was carrying the burden of knowledge. We're the only ones who know it's there. But we didn't do anything about it. So the damned corpse is more than just a grisly memory. It's unfinished business. 
According to the shrinks, that's what messes up your head more than anything. Unfinished business. Maybe we need to deal with it, Larry told himself. Take some kind of action to get the thing out of our systems. Let's drive out and get it, Pete said. Larry felt as if his breath had been knocked out. You're kidding, he said. You're out of your gourd, Barbara said. Hey, if he's going to write a book about that jukebox, he ought to have it. Or better yet, I ought to have it. Larry can keep track of my progress repairing the thing so he gets the details right. You know, there's nothing like first-hand experience to give a book. Verisimilitude, Larry put in. Yeah, that's it. I don't know, Larry said. He took a sip of his vodka tonic and shook his head. He wished he hadn't mentioned the box. Normally, he didn't discuss story ideas with anyone. But Pete and Barbara were part of this one. They'd discovered the jukebox. Pete's desire to take it home had really been the inspiration. So the story had rolled out. Should have kept my mouth shut. The last thing I want to do is go driving out to Sagebrush Flat. Pete got up from his lawn chair and checked the barbecue. The flames had died away, but Larry could tell from where he sat that the briquettes were burning. The air over the grill shimmered with heat waves. Be another ten, fifteen minutes, Pete said. He turned to Barbara, arched a dark eyebrow. Don't you need to go inside and do something? Trying to get rid of me? Just trying to be helpful. We're going to have those sautéed mushrooms. We'll want them with our steaks. They only take a few minutes, she said. I'll do them up when you put the meat on. Good, Larry thought. He wasn't eager for her to leave. Not only was she the best defense against Pete's crazy urge to fetch the jukebox, but it felt good to look at her. She sat on a lounge in front of him, bare legs stretched out on its cushion. Her long, slim legs looked wonderful in spite of the scabbed areas. She wore red shorts and a plain white T-shirt. The shorts were very short. The T-shirt lay softly against her flat belly and the rises of her breasts. Its fabric was thin enough to show a faint pink hue of the skin underneath, the dark crust of the scabs above Barbara's waist, the white of her bra. He watched the way her muscles moved as she sat up straight to take a drink of her cocktail and settled back again and rested the glass on the moist disc it had left just below the hip of her shorts. You don't want to go back there, do you? she asked Larry. Not a whole lot. I didn't think so. It's probably too heavy for the two of us to carry anyway, he told Pete. Barbara will come along and lend a hand, won't you, hon? Not in your life. She's just scared of the vampire. You know it. Besides, we don't need that piece of junk cluttering up the garage. It'd be great for Larry's book. He can come over and check it out whenever he needs some inspiration. Looking at Larry, he added, and we can take pictures of it. You know, a photo of the actual jukebox, all shot up the way it is. That'll be terrific on your cover. That would be pretty neat, he admitted. Geez, don't encourage him. Larry smiled at her. I have no intention of going back to that place. You're scared of the vampire too, huh? Pete said. Hey, it can't hurt you, not as long as it's got that stake in its heart. I'm not worried about any vampire, Larry told him. I don't think it is a vampire, but stiffs give me the creeps. That's a good one coming from you. I'm scared of my own shadow, man. That's what makes me good at writing those books. And I tell you, Sagebrush Flat is a lot scarier to me than my shadow. My shadow pales by comparison. Barbara chuckled at his pun. Even if there were no corpse under the stairway, I'd still want to stay away from that town. Just the fact that it's deserted is enough to spook me. There's something basically frightening about a place where people are supposed to be but aren't. An abandoned town. An office building at night. That's really true, you know, Barbara said. Like a hotel really late at night when everyone's asleep. Or a school, Larry added. Or a church. Yeah. Her eyes widened. Churches are really spooky when nobody's there. I used to go for choir practice when I was in high school. We'd meet on Wednesday nights at eight. She leaned forward and gazed at Larry. One night. God, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. Hunching up her shoulders, she squeezed her arms tight against her sides. One night, practice had been called off and I didn't know about it. I think we'd been out of town. Anyway, the choir director was sick and everybody knew it but me. 
So my dad dropped me off in the parking lot, and I went in. You taking notes, Lair? Maybe you can use this. Sounds promising so far. He could feel himself shivering slightly, as if Barbara's fear were contagious. There was a light on in the narthex, but the stairway to the choir loft was dark. I went up there anyway. I figured I was just the first to arrive. The choir loft was dark, too. Why didn't you turn on some lights? Pete asked. I don't know. I guess I thought I shouldn't mess with anything like light switches. But also, I was afraid somebody might... Turning on lights, you know, that'd be like giving away that I was there. Her mouth stretched, baring her teeth. That's the thing, Larry said. When a place seems deserted, you're afraid you aren't really alone. That's it, exactly. Because you can't see what's out there. God, I started thinking someone was roaming around, sneaking up on me. I even thought I heard someone creeping up the stairs. Her right hand still held the glass on her lap. Her other hand crossed over to that arm and rubbed it as if she wanted to smooth away the goosebumps. Larry saw that her thighs were pebbled. Though she wore a bra, it was apparently of a light, stretchy fabric. Her nipples made small points against her T-shirt. I'll have to remember that, Larry thought. A woman has goose flesh. The nipples get erect. Fear makes them hard. Or is she turned on? Turned on by the fear. Barbara kept frowning, rubbing her arm. She seemed lost in her memory of that night. So what happened? Pete asked. She shook her head. Nothing. Oh, that's a great story. I waited around for about fifteen minutes. I was almost too scared to move. I kept staring down at the nave and pulpit and everything, and thought someone was down there in the dark. You know, aware of me, watching me. Coming for you, Pete added. Damn right. They're coming for you, he said, mimicking the voice of the jerky brother in the graveyard scene of The Night of the Living Dead. They're coming for... Knock it off, would you? Nobody ever showed up? Larry asked. She shook her head. I finally beat it. I was never so glad to get out of a place in my life. Not even the hole in the landing of the Sagebrush Flat Hotel? Pete asked. That was different. I was in pain. That's not the same as being scared half to death. So you finally just bolted out of the church? Larry asked. Sure did. I didn't even stop to use the phone and call home. I waited in the parking lot, and Dad finally came along at the usual time to pick me up. That's it, huh? Pete asked. It was enough. I quit the choir after that. Nothing was ever going to get me back into the church after dark. Pretty drastic, considering that nothing happened. It wasn't exactly as if nothing happened, Larry pointed out. That's right. All these years have passed, and it still gives me the creeps if I think about it. Still isn't much of a story, Pete said. A good setup for one, Larry told him. Think you might use it? Pete asked. I can just see it, Barbara said, smiling. You'd probably have a homicidal maniac chasing me through the pews. Something like that. Maybe Jesus gets down off the cross and stalks the gal through the church. Oh, sick. Pete laughed. Hey, goes after her with a nail in each hand. You guys. That's good, Larry said. Next morning, the preacher shows up and she's the one on the cross. God's going to get you for that, Barbara warned. More than likely. I better put the stakes on, Pete said. Feed him quick before a lightning bolt comes down and knocks him out of his shoes. After dinner, Pete presented his surprise, a plastic bag containing three videotapes. Thought we'd have a movie marathon unless you're in a big hurry to get home. With three vodka tonics under his belt and the two beers he'd had with dinner, Larry knew he was in no condition to write, make corrections on his copy-edited manuscript, or even read the Hudson novel. Nor was he eager to be alone in his empty house. Sounds good to me, he said. Let's see what you've got. He inspected the tapes through their clear plastic boxes. Cameron's Closet, Blood Frenzy, and Floater. Barb phoned me at the shop, Pete explained, so I picked these up on the way home. He looked quite pleased with himself. Oh, this will be neat, Larry said. These should put you in a great mood, Barbara said, for when it's time to go home. They freak you out, you can spend the night here. 
I imagine I'll be all right. They started with blood frenzy. Pete watched from a recliner beside the sofa. Larry sat at one end of the sofa, Barbara at the other. After a while, she tossed a cushion onto the coffee table and propped her feet up. When the movie ended, Pete made popcorn. Barbara disappeared for a few minutes. She came back wearing a knee-length blue robe. She filled glasses with Pepsi for everyone. Pete separated the popcorn into three bowls. Before returning to her place on the sofa, Barbara turned off all the lights. They munched popcorn, drank their sodas, and watched Cameron's closet in a room that was dark except for the glow from the television screen. Every now and then, Larry glanced at Barbara. She was slumped against the back of the sofa, popcorn bowl on her lap, her legs stretched out, feet resting on the cushion she had earlier placed on the coffee table. When she twisted sideways to set her empty bowl on the lamp table, the robe slipped off her left leg. She wore a pink diaphanous nightgown. It was shorter than the robe. It didn't reach down much farther than her hip. With a quiet moan of annoyance, she flung the fallen section of the robe back on top of her thigh. This is sure better than being home, Larry thought. A few minutes later, she took the cushion out from under her feet. She tilted it against the armrest, swiveled herself around, and swung her legs onto the sofa. She lay down on her side, head propped on the cushion. Let me know if I kick you, she said. Maybe I should get out of your way. No, that's fine. Pete looked over. Oh, here we go. For God's sake, Barb, sit up. You won't last five minutes. I'm wide awake. You won't be. I'm warning you, I'm not going to rewind. You drift off, it's your hard luck. I'm not going to drift off. Famous last words, Pete said. Lair, you catch her dropping off. Pinch her. Don't you dare. She tucked the robe in between the backs of her legs, as if to prevent Larry from reaching up inside it for the pinch. It was the sort of thing that Jean might do. The casual warning and precaution hinted at an intimacy that was both comforting and exciting. Larry used the remote to rewind the few seconds of the movie that he'd missed while complaining to Barbara. She lasted more than five minutes, but not more than ten. Larry realized she was asleep when her legs straightened and one of her bare feet pushed against the side of his thigh. Her touch made warmth flow through him. He waited for a while, enjoying the sensation, but it made him feel guilty. Pete, he finally said. She zonked. Barbara. She flinched, lifted her face off the cushion. No, I'm fine. You dozed off. No, I didn't. I'm fine. Her head settled down again, her eyes drifted shut. Forget it, Pete said. She can watch it in the morning if she wants to. I'm watching, she mumbled. Larry tried to watch the movie. Her right foot made it difficult. So did the way the top of her robe hung open, revealing most of her right breast through the flimsy pink nightgown. The show on the TV screen was good, but the stolen glimpses were better. Sometimes the foot rubbed him. Near the end of the movie, she stretched out her left leg. Its foot pushed across the top of his thigh and rested on his lap. The pressure there made him squirm. He wrapped his hand around Barbara's ankle and guided her foot down beside the other. Huh? she moaned. Sorry, kicking you? It's all right, he said. Pete looked around, frowning. Christ, Barb, you're screwing up the movie. Why don't you just go to bed? Yeah... Maybe I better. Shit, Larry thought. She pushed herself up and staggered to her feet. Night, guys. Sorry I pooped out on you, Larry. No problem. Thanks for the dinner and everything. Glad you could make it. See ya. She made her way around the coffee table. Larry could see through her robe when she stepped in front of him. Her breasts swayed a little as she bent over and kissed Pete goodnight. Then she was gone. The room seemed empty without her. During the final moments of Cameron's closet, Larry heard a toilet flush. Pete removed the tape from the VCR. He grinned over his shoulder. Free at last, free at last, he said. Thank God Almighty, free at last. If you want to turn in. Are you kidding? He pushed the tape of floater into the machine and started it playing. Back in a second, he hurried away. He came back while the screen still showed its warning against unauthorized use of a videotape. He had a bottle of Irish whiskey in one hand and two glasses in the other. 
He sat next to Larry on the sofa. He filled the two glasses. Party time, he said. I'm going to be wasted tomorrow. The cats are away. Got to live it up. They watched the movie until their glasses were empty. Pete refilled them both, then pressed the stop button on his remote. The horror film was replaced by a black and white John Wayne movie. Larry recognized it immediately as The Sands of Iwo Jima. Why'd you turn it off? he asked. A grin stretched the corners of Pete's mouth. Fourteen. How about a little excursion, Pete said. What do you mean? Sagebrush flat. You're kidding, Larry said. Who's gonna stop us? I don't want to go out there. Pete clapped a hand down on Larry's knee. His eyes gleamed with mischief, but he wasn't smiling. He looked like a kid, a kid with a mustache and some gray in his hair, and with big plans to pull off a caper. We take the van. We drive out there, pick up the jukebox, and we'll be back in two, three hours. Barb zonked. She'll never know. She'll know when she finds the thing in your garage. Okay, so we'll leave it over at your place. What do you say, Lair? I think it's crazy. Hey, man, an adventure. It'll be great. You can use it in your book. You know, tell all about how the two guys sneak off in the middle of the night to bring the thing back. You can write it the way it happens, you know. Won't have to tax the old imagination. It's crazy. Don't you want the box? Not that badly. What about a photo for the cover of your book? Well, that'd be neat, but... So we'll take my camera. Maybe we won't bring the thing back, you know. Maybe we can't even lift it. But at least we'll have some pictures. We could do that during the day. You know the kind of heat I'd get from Barbara. She'd give me all kinds of shit. How about it? You really want to go now? The digital clock on the VCR showed 12.05. No time like the present. A midnight mission. The idea frightened Larry. It also excited him. He felt a vibration that seemed to hum through his nerves. When was the last time, he wondered, that you did something really daring? If you chicken out, you'll regret it, and Pete'll think you're a pussy. A real adventure. Just like Tom and Huck, he said. Huh? Tom Sawyer climbed out his window in the middle of the night and went with Huck to a graveyard to cure their warts. I always wished I could do something like that. You got warts, man? Let's go for it. Grinning, Pete refilled the glasses. Fun and games, he toasted. They clinked their glasses and drank. Pete took his glass with him. He turned on a lamp at the end of the sofa. Then he removed the tape from the VCR, flicked off the television, and left the room. Larry sipped whiskey while he waited. It warmed him but didn't ease the thrumming vibrations. When Pete returned, he wore a gun belt. His three fifty seven hung in the holster against his right leg. Dangling by a strap around his neck was a camera with a flash attachment. I checked the bedroom, he said in a low voice. Barb's out like a light. Pete set his empty glass down. He capped the whiskey bottle and handed it to Larry. You be the keeper of the hooch. We shouldn't take it with us. Fuck that. Who's gonna know? If we get stopped, we won't. Calm down. You'll live longer. They went to the door. Pete turned off the lamp. They stepped outside. Standing under the porch light, Pete locked the front door with his key. Larry, shivering, hugged his chest as he hurried toward the van at the curb. A chilly wind pushed at him. He thought about stopping by his house for a jacket. But Pete wasn't bundled up. Pete still wore his short-sleeved knit shirt and blue jeans. If he can take it, I can, Larry told himself. Besides, it'll be all right once we're in the van. The van felt warm. It must have been like an oven before the sun went down, and it still retained a lot of the heat. Larry settled into the passenger seat and sighed. Pass it over. He handed the bottle to Pete, who took a swig and gave it back. Larry took a drink. Are you all right to drive? he asked. You kidding? I don't hardly even have a good buzz on. I do, Larry thought. I'm buzzing all right. But it isn't the booze. Just good old-fashioned excitement and maybe fear. Pete started the van. He kept the headlights off for a while. After turning the first corner, he put them on. They drilled into the night. Hey, this is something, you know that? 
You think you can find the town? No sweat. We stay away from the hotel, though, right? If you say so. Pete drove in silence for several minutes. They were on Riverfront Drive before he looked at Larry and said, You know what I don't understand? How come you want to write about the jukebox instead of the vampire? Vampire books are a dime a dozen. Not true ones. Don't get me wrong, I think your jukebox story sounds pretty neat. But I think the true story of how you found a vampire in a ghost town would be different, you know? Different, all right. Remember that movie, The Amityville Horror? That was supposed to be a true story. It was supposed to be, Larry said, but I've heard the whole thing was made up. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. The thing is, they claimed it was true, and that's what made it. Would have been just another haunted house movie, except for that. You're supposed to think it actually happened, right? Right. It was based on a book, wasn't it? Yeah, and the book was pushed as non-fiction. Did the book sell okay? Are you kidding? It sold a ton. So what's to keep you from writing up this vampire thing as non-fiction? Have a big bestseller. They make a movie out of it. Presto, you're rich and famous. Shit. What do you mean, shit? You got something against money? I'm doing okay. Sure, you're doing okay, but how many bestsellers have you had? You can do just fine without ever having a book on the bestseller lists. Those guys on the lists, they're making millions. Pete whistled softly. That much? Sure, some of those guys get a million up front, or more. That's before paperback rights, foreign rights, movie sales. Christ, and you're not interested? I didn't say I'm not interested. I just don't want to mess with any vampire. Hey, let's not kid ourselves here. The thing's not a vampire. It's just some broad with a stake in her chest. But we don't know that. Not for sure. Neither will your readers. That's what keeps the story going. Wait till the very end, then you pull the stake. That's like the final chapter, you know? You pull the stake and see what happens. I don't know. They left the lights of Mulehead Bend behind. Pete turned off the main road and headed west into the desert. There were no more street lamps. The headlights pushed paths of brightness up the lane in front of him. The moon cast a pale glow over the bleak landscape of boulders, scrub bushes, cacti, and the jagged mountains in the distance. It looked cold and forlorn out there. Larry suddenly wanted to turn back. It was bad enough, driving through this bleak terrain on the way to a jukebox. But that obviously wasn't what Pete had in mind. What are we really doing? Larry asked. Just what we planned. Bring the jukebox back. Or just take some pictures if we can't carry it. Then what's this vampire business? Just a thought. Hey, you don't like the idea? Fine. I'm not trying to push you into something. But Jesus, why on earth would you want to pass up a chance to make a million bucks? The thing scares me. That's the point. He reached over, took the bottle from Larry, drank from it, and handed it back. The point is, you're in the business of scaring people, right? Scaring them with fiction, not the real thing. They want real scares, they can watch the TV news. This wouldn't be all that different from your novels. Hey, we are talking about vampires, not homicides or nuclear war. The only difference is, this would be a true story and it'd fit right in with your image, you know? This is the sort of thing that'd make publicity people drool. Get this, renowned horror writer discovers vampire on weekend outing. It's a natural. They'd put you on the tube, man. And here's the best part. You could take her with you. Oh, wonderful. Just let him try to say you made the whole thing up. Great, you've got me carting a corpse around on the talk show circuit. We're talking about a million bucks, Lair. I'd sure do it. Be my guest. I can't write for shit, and you've got... His head snapped around. I've got it. I'll be the main guy. You can be the guy who takes it all down. You're Watson. You're Boswell. Yeah, whatever. God, I wish we had a recorder. We ought to have all this on tape for the book. You're really serious. Damn straight. Can you remember all this? Hell, we should have laid off the booze. Right. Larry took another swallow of it. 
I see this as a major book and movie. It's a natural. It does have potential, Larry admitted. Potential? It'll be a blockbuster. It'll need a story, though. Hey, man, we're living the story right now. You started off with last Sunday when we found the thing. You write it just the way it happened. That's a few chapters worth right there. Then you've got tonight. And how we go off to get the jukebox, but I talk you into getting the vampire instead. That's maybe fifty pages, Larry said. Then what? You just tell it like it happens. Describe us going into the hotel, taking out the corpse, putting it in the van, and taking it home. To whose house? Have you got any good hiding places? Nowhere that Jean wouldn't find it. Besides, I don't like keeping secrets from her. How do you think she'd react? To having a corpse in the house? In the garage, say. I don't think she'd be delighted by the idea. Barb would just shit. So much for the blockbuster, Larry said. Pete went silent. Thank God, Larry thought. Good thing we're both married. That ought to nip the idea right in the bud. He felt enormous relief. He took a drink of whiskey and sighed. I've got it, Pete blurted. That's part of the story. We need stuff to happen after we get the thing, right? You can put all the stuff in there about Jean and Barbara giving us grief about the thing. But we talked them into letting us keep it. Now you're talking fiction. We just explained to them, you know? It's not like we'll be keeping the thing forever. Just a couple of months, maybe, while you're working on the book. With a big jackpot at the end, I think the gals might go for it. Where's the big jackpot for Barbara? I'm getting a cut, right? Yeah, I may cut your throat. Then I can do a book on that while I'm in prison. What do you say, 20%? My idea, after all. You wouldn't do it at all if it weren't for me. True enough, not that I'm planning to do it at all regardless. The whole thing's crazy. That's what makes it so great. It's crazy. It's wild. You think Stephen King would pass up a chance like this? Hell, he'd probably do it for the fun of it. Why don't you give him a try? I've got his address. Because you're my pal. I don't want to take this away from you. This is your big chance. Thanks. So what do you say? Are you in? If you tell him no, Larry thought, he'll never forgive you. He's probably already calculated 20% of a million bucks. It'd be like robbing him. No more outings with him and Barbara. No more drinks and dinner with him. The end of all that. He thought about the fun they'd had during the past year. He thought about Barbara stretched out on the sofa and the way she had tucked the back of her robe between her legs. Wouldn't necessarily end the friendship, he told himself. But it would sure put a strain on it. And Pete was right about the book. It could be big. It could be another Amityville horror. Doing it would mean spending a lot more time with Pete, too. With Pete and Barbara. It would also mean bringing the corpse into your life. Probably not so bad once you got used to it. I think we'll have real trouble with the wives, he said. Nothing we can't handle. What do you say, man? I guess we could rent a room for it or something, if they won't let us keep it around. Sure, we'll figure something out. Are you in? Maybe. Aha. Let's just play it by ear, okay? We'll have a look at the thing, but I still want to do the jukebox book. So let's take care of that first and see how it goes. Oh, man. Hey, this is the start of something big. We ought to have our heads examined. Fifteen. When reaching headlights found Babe's garage at the east end of Sagebrush Flat, Pete killed the beams and eased off the gas pedal. They entered the town, moving slowly. Larry studied the moonlit street ahead of them. He felt trapped by their crazy plan, but he held on to a hope that something might intercede to stop it. They needed privacy. If a car were here, if light came from a doorway or window. But the street looked abandoned. The buildings were dark. The van rolled to a halt in front of the Sagebrush Flat Hotel. Leaning forward, Pete peered past Larry. They both stared toward the doors, but the hotel blocked the moonlight, throwing a black shroud of shadow all the way to the sidewalk. The blackness looked solid. Unable to see the doors, Larry imagined them standing wide open, imagined he was gazing deep into the lobby, pictured the cadaver on her withered feet beside the staircase, staring out at them. 
His skin crawled, his scrotum shriveled, tingling as if spiders were scurrying on it. Drive on ahead, he whispered. Right, the box. The van moved forward. He lifted a hand to his chest and fingered a nipple through the fabric of his shirt. It felt like a pebble. True of guys, too, he thought. You get goosebumps, your nipples get hard. He remembered the way Barbara had looked as she told her story about the dark church. Focusing his mind on that, he lost the image of the corpse. But he felt guilty about using Barbara that way, so he thought about Jean. Jean on Sunday night after her nightmare, slipping out of her gown, climbing onto him. But then he was kneeling above her, and her slim body looked cadaverous in the shadows, and he was suddenly in the hotel on his knees beside the coffin, staring at the corpse. Dried brown skin, ghastly grin, flat breasts, pubic hair shining like gold in the flashlight's beam. He shook his head to dislodge the images and let out a shaky breath. I don't know if I can hack this, he muttered. Never fear, Peter's here. Pete drove past Holman's, made a U-turn, and parked in front of the gasoline pumps. He shut off the engine. They each took a drink of whiskey. Let's take it with us, Pete said. Let's not. I want my hands free. Larry capped the bottle and set it on the floor. They climbed out, leaning against the chilly wind. Larry trudged to the rear of the van. Pete met him there. He had his flashlight, but left it dark. Side by side, they walked past the corner of Holman's. The desert ahead of them looked gray, as if its rock-littered surface, boulders, and bushes were painted with dirty cream. They were almost to the rear corner of Holman's when a vague shape darted in front of them. Larry flinched. Pete, gasping, crouched and snatched out his gun. The wind-tossed tumbleweed bounded on by. Shit, Pete muttered, holstering his weapon. Good going, quick draw. I'm not the only one nervous around here, he thought. It pleased him to know that Pete was also feeling jumpy. Maybe you should turn on the flashlight, he suggested. It'd give us away. To whom? You never know, man. You never know. They left Holman's behind and headed out into the desert, angling toward the far-off smoke tree that marked the edge of the stream bed. Another tumbleweed crossed their path, but Pete saw this one coming and didn't draw down on it. Larry studied the landscape ahead. He wished it didn't have so many clumps of rock and brush. Hiding places. Each time he approached one, he tightened with fear. Each time he passed one, he quickly looked behind it, half expecting to find someone crouched and ready to pounce. Nobody's here except us, he kept telling himself. But he couldn't convince himself. At last they reached the rim of the embankment. Larry turned around. He scanned the area they had just finished crossing. Pete did the same. Then they faced forward. The area below them lay in shadow. Pete turned on his flashlight. He played its beam over the slope and started down. Larry stayed close to his side. They stopped a few times while Pete waved his light across the bottom of the gully as if to assure himself that no surprises were waiting down there. The stream bed didn't look familiar to Larry. He was sure it hadn't changed since Sunday, but it seemed very different in the darkness. He couldn't even tell for certain which was the rock that Barbara had been sitting on. We might not be here now, he thought, if she hadn't wandered away from the Holmans, looking for a place to relieve herself. We wouldn't have found the jukebox. Maybe the corpse, but I never would have started out tonight except for the jukebox. He realized that he had to urinate himself. When he reached the bottom of the embankment, he said, Hang on a minute. I've got to take a leak. Don't get any on you, Pete said. Want the light? Yeah, thanks. He took the flashlight. Pete waited while he wandered to the left, stepping around blocks of stone. He clamped the light under his arm to free his hands. With his back to Pete, he opened his pants. The wind felt good against his penis. He aimed his stream straight out. The wind flapped it sideways, but not back at him. When he was done, he zipped up his pants and started to turn around. The pale beam of the flashlight passed across a circle of black surrounded by rocks. Hey, Pete, come here. I don't want to get my feet wet. Come here. He took the flashlight out from under his arm while Pete came up beside him. He pointed it at the circle. Look at that. A campfire. Was that here before? I don't know. Might have been, but I didn't see it. They walked toward it. 
The center of the fire circle was black with ashes and the charred remains of wood. And bones. Larry saw half a dozen bones intact among the dead centers, gray and knobbed at each end. Holy shit, Pete muttered. Rabbit, you think? Pete squatted. He picked up a bone that was nearly a foot in length. This sucker didn't come from any rabbit, he said. A coyote, maybe. Who the hell would eat a coyote? The fucking madman of the desert, that's who. Pete tossed the bone down. This'll go good in our book. Great, Larry muttered. Pete pressed a hand against one of the sooty rocks. Still warm. Don't give me that. It is. Crouching, Larry touched one of the rocks for himself. It was cold. Asshole. Pete laughed. Had you going there, huh? Prick. Get out of the way. I'm going to take some pictures. He backed off, but kept the light on the fire circle while Pete removed the lens cap, switched on the camera and its flash attachment. What if the guy who did this is still around here? No sweat. He's already eaten. A guy who eats coyotes isn't someone I want to meet. He's probably long gone. Pete raised the camera to his eye, bent over the remains of the fire for a close-up, and took a shot. The flash strobed, hitting the area with a quick blast of white. He stepped backward. One stride, two. Then another flash split the darkness. In that blink of white, Larry saw something beyond the fire circle. He found it with the beam of his flashlight. Oh, my God, he muttered. Three rocks were stacked up. At the top rested the head of a coyote, its gray fur matted with blood, a bone held crosswise between its teeth. It had bloody holes where its eyes should have been. Pete lowered his camera and stared. Wow, he muttered. Maybe we ought to get out of here. Pete flapped a hand at him and stepped closer to the thing. He raised the camera. He took a shot. In the stark flick of light, Larry saw into the empty sockets. He started gagging as Pete stepped right up in front of it, crouched, and snapped another picture. He turned aside and vomited. When he finished, he backed away from the mess. He took out his handkerchief, blew his nose, and wiped his lips. He blinked tears from his eyes. He rubbed them with the back of a hand. You all right? Pete asked, coming up behind him. Christ, he muttered. Feeling a little queasy myself. Bad scene. Guy that did that must be a fucking lunatic. You see the way he poked out its eyes? Wonder if he did that before he ate. Larry shook his head. Let's do the jukebox and get out of here. Give me the light. I want to check around, see what else we can find. Are you nuts? He kept the flashlight and started walking through the gully toward the place where they'd found the jukebox. Ah, Pete said, what the hell? Don't want to lose my supper. Wouldn't taste half as good on the way out. His head swung around. A shiver rushed up Larry's back. What is it? Nothing, I guess. Did you hear something? Probably just the wind. Unless it's our crazy fucking coyote muncher sneaking up on us. Cut it out. Wonder if he talked to the thing while he ate. You know, like put the head up there for a dinner companion, had a little chat with it, talked to the head while he ate the body. It was an image, Larry realized, that had passed through his own mind while he was vomiting. Wonder if he ate the eyes. Larry hadn't thought of that. He probably just didn't like the thing staring at him. Maybe. Guess we'll never know. Unless we get a chance to ask him. Pete chuckled. Give me a break. Larry stepped around a large rock. He pointed the light at it. Is that where Barbara was sitting? I think so. He swept the beam forward until it found a thick clump of bushes on the right. He glimpsed chrome and dirty red plastic through the foliage. There. They hurried the final distance. Larry stared down at the machine, resting smashed and bullet-riddled in the bushes. He imagined a photograph of it on the cover of his book, The Box, by Lawrence Dunbar. That's the book I'm going to write, he told himself, not some damn thing about a vampire. See if we can lift it? Pete asked, squatting down. He saw them struggling to carry it up the steep embankment. He saw himself stumble, fall, roll down the slope. The box tumbled and crashed down on top of him. Pete lifted it off. We'd better not try to move you, Lair. I'll go get help. Pete left the revolver with him and hurried away. He lay there, alone and half paralyzed. Soon he heard someone creeping toward him.
a ragged hermit dripping coyote blood, a knife in his hand. What makes me think there's only one of them, he wondered. What do you think, Pete asked. Let's not try it. Yeah, maybe you're right. God knows what's under the thing, or inside it for that matter. Don't want to go upsetting a rattler, or a nest of scorpions or something. That's what I like about you, Larry said. Adventurous, but not foolish. My mama didn't raise no morons. Pete got to his feet. He backed away from the box and lifted the camera. Larry stepped aside. He faced the length of the gully and probed its darkness with the flashlight. The campfire and the grisly remains of the coyote were well beyond the range of the pale beam. He swept the light from side to side. None of the rocks or bushes in sight seemed large enough to conceal a person. You spot Ragu the desert rat, Pete said. Give us a yell. I won't yell. I'll scream. Pete laughed. Larry kept watch, his back to Pete. In his peripheral vision, he noticed four blinks of light. Why don't you get into the picture, Pete suggested. We'll get a couple of you with the famous jukebox. Though reluctant to abandon his guard duty, he stepped backward until he came to the box. He crouched beside it. A red light on the flash attachment beamed a ray at his face. Say cheese. Come on, get it over with. Say head cheese. Screw you. White light hit his eyes. Pete took another photo, then stepped closer and fired two more. That ought to do it. Sure did my night vision. He stood up, shutting his eyes and rubbing them. Bright sparks and balls fluttered under his lids. We done down here? Pete asked. I sure hope so. Want to go back and pick up a souvenir? Take it home with us? Put it in the freezer? Yeah, why don't you do that? Ha, you think I'm out of my tree? You want to take the corpse back, Larry said, stepping past the bushes and starting to climb the slope. What's the big difference? The corpse isn't all bloody and gross. It looked pretty gross to me. Well, the coyote head ain't worth a million bucks. For a million smackaroonies, I'd pick the thing up in my bare hands and walk home with it. Would you eat it? Larry asked, starting to feel almost cheerful as he approached the top of the embankment. Who'd give me a million bucks to eat it? It's hypothetical. Would I get to cook it up first? Nope, gotta chow it down raw. You're a sick man. Me? They reached the top, and the wind pushed against Larry. It seemed to be blowing much harder up here than in the gully. But he was glad to be out. He felt as if he had been an intruder in the lair of the coyote eater. Ragu the desert rat. He hurried forward, wanting to put as much distance as possible between himself and the madman's domain. Now and then he glanced back. So did Pete, but not as often. At last they reached the van. Larry flung himself onto the passenger seat, slammed the door shut, and locked it. The warmth felt wonderful, and it was good to be out of the wind. The skin of his face and arms felt tingly from the buffeting. He opened the whiskey bottle and took a couple of sips while Pete climbed in behind the steering wheel. He offered the bottle to Pete. Pete shook his head. He flicked a switch and light filled the van. With a nervous glance at Larry, he slipped between the seats. Larry watched him move in a crouch toward the rear of the van, head darting from side to side, fingers wrapped around the handle of his holstered magnum. Christ, he's afraid someone might have gotten in. Pete searched the length of the van and turned around. It's cool, he said, coming back. In his seat again, he shut off the interior lights. He started the engine. He reached out, and Larry put the bottle in his hand. He drank, then gave it back. Now, are we ready for the real fun? I think I've had enough fun for one night. You aren't going yellow on me, are you? What'll we do with the corpse if we do take it home? You write a book about it. About what? Having a pseudo-vampire as a house guest? Exactly. It'll just lie there. That's if the women don't make us get rid of it. You're right. We'll have to do something with it. Maybe we can find out who she is. How would we do that? First things first, Lair. Let's take her home, then figure out what's next. Why don't we not take her home till we figure that out? Hey, we're already here. When'll we get another chance like this? Come on, man, we agreed. Don't bail out on me now. I'm not bailing out. I just don't see what we'll accomplish. Our book has to be a lot more than a couple of goofs taking a stiff home and freaking out their wives. 
Even a true story needs action along the way, drama, a climax. Especially a climax. We've got nothing. Well, eventually we pull the stake. And the damn thing still just lies there. Maybe, maybe not. Oh, come on. You said yourself she's not a vampire. We don't know that for sure. Obviously, someone thinks she is. Okay, suppose we pull the stake and she is a vampire. That'd be something, huh? Then we've got a bestseller for sure. If she doesn't bite our necks. We'll take precautions when the time comes. You know, have plenty of crucifixes and garlic candy. Maybe buy some handcuffs or tie her up. So what happens if we pull the stake and nothing happens? Which is the way it's bound to go down. Then what? Pete started the van moving forward. A big dud, that's what, Larry told him. Pete eased the van onto the road. It rolled slowly toward the Sagebrush Flat Hotel. Let's just go home and forget about it. You said we should play it by ear. My ear tells me to forget it. I've got a better idea. Pete's head turned toward Larry. In the hazy moonlight, his teeth seemed to glow as he smiled. You say we've got a dud if we pull the stake and she just lies there. Well, let's find out tonight if she's a vampire. He eased the van to the other side of the street and stopped in front of the hotel. Let's go in there and pull the stake.